Hey, just so you know, I didn't hear any of that music. I could uh, I could watch the little stuff scroll by. I'm saying this mostly for the producer, and it's fine. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the Sunday show here on the line. I'm Matt Dillahoney, and joining me this week, Eric from Skeptics and Scouters. How are you, sir? Hey, folks. I'm doing good, Matt. Thanks for asking. Very happy to have you. Now, you were on Skeptalk last week with uh, John. Uh, I was. Yeah, filling uh, in, but you've done this, you know, you've done a hang up and everything else. So you're just like almost, yeah. you're like this close to just being a regular on the line now. We can hope. It's all good. So, so glad to have you here. Uh, just, just to get the announcements and stuff out of the way, this is a live call in program called the Sunday show right here on the line. The entire network, the line is run based on call in shows. Uh, that doesn't mean every show will be all call in all the time. We'll occasionally have guests and other uh special events and things like that but tomorrow uh monday it's going to be forrest valkai and seth andrews on skep talk at 6 p.m central tuesday is going to be dave warnock and shannon q on dying out loud that's tuesdays at six central uh i'll be back on wednesday with j mike at six central and then the transatlantic call-in show will be this thursday with arden hart and luxander at 2 p.m central same time as we're doing right now so we've got the basically this if we're not on at 2 p.m we're on at 6 p.m and we're on sunday show monday tuesday wednesday thursday and then on friday and saturdays we end up doing sometimes uh because i wanna and other special shows like that uh, we got a an amazing community that we're building here. And so many people have been subscribing over the last year or so. We're up over 86,000 subscribers. It's like 50,000 more than uh, I remember when we, we first started in here. So if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe now. Click the like button. Do all those sorts of things. There's also information down below the show in the show description about how else you can support the show and the community. Uh, more information about our guests and everything like that. The key though, is we are a, a a mixed up collection of skeptics and secularists who are doing what we can to have communications and conversations with people who don't share our beliefs either so that we can learn and change um, and we have learned and have changed or so that they can learn and change or that maybe you watching can learn and change as what often happens in these discussions is they'll get heated and nothing will happen between uh the person on on either end of the telephone the telephone number is down below on the screen uh 720-619-2288 we have all of our lines or almost all of our lines are currently full uh and uh we have now i i say we're always going to give theists priority, and we will. Um, so we have a couple of theists on the line right now. Are you ready to get the calls? Absolutely. Let's go. Sweet. Uh, caller Tupac with no pronouns in California is calling in now. How are you? What's going on? What's going on? What's up? Yeah, I called into. Uh to tell you about or to tell everyone listening uh that i experienced three miracles first miracle yeah. was i'm gonna just go through them real quick the first miracle was hang on hang on just a second father. so i I'm, I'm having a little hard time hearing you it's a little muffled uh but if, if i'm understanding correctly you evidently have three miracles that you called in to tell us about and uh you want to give details on those miracles is that correct Sure, if you want Hello? the details, sure. Sure. It, it also says here you called back in March with a different name and different pronouns, wanting advice on what to do if your doctor was denying your hormone treatment. So I'm confused. Um, previously, that's funny, that you, you, that's funny that you would try to bust that out because I didn't call this show with that information. I called a different show, but that's funny you wanted to conflate that. Yeah, yeah. See, you didn't call this show. But you called this network and it saves your phone information. So you're calling now a diff on a different occasion from the same phone line. You're calling the exact same number. So I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I don't see why that matters. Is there a reason you brought that up? I'm 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 just wondering if you you had called previously uh, with a completely different name and pronouns, and today you're on with a different name and pronoun. So I'm to know if maybe you changed your number or what the confusion was okay why does it matter what why doesn't it matter what the hell does that have to do with whether a miracle happened or not 
I don't know. I don't know whether a miracle happened or not. I haven't gotten to your to your miracles, and I don't know how we could possibly confirm those miracles. But you do realize you ha you have to realize that as a call in show, we get a lot of prank callers and people pretending and making up stories. How you know, can I, I realize that you're, is that you're trying to manipulate me? You're trying to get into my emotions, and that's disgusting. So, do you want to hear oh, about I, the miracles? Because I don't really care if you want to hear, but I would like to tell everybody else about them. Everybody else, okay? Then, back then, God, then no, so. I don't. Then no, I don't give a shit about your miracles or anything else because I wasn't trying to get in your, in your emotions. I'm trying to figure out whether or not you're honest, and if you're going to actually convey your stories here, it would be nice if you were honest. And I'm sorry that you don't understand that and shows where people get prank calls. It's not about trying to manipulate your emotions. It's about trying to figure out whether or not you're a big fucking liar. Are you a big fucking liar? If I say no, does that prove I'm not? No, it doesn't. Thanks, thanks for a great lesson in skepticism. Give me one of your miracles. Just no, one. I'll give all three of them. No, you'll give the one or you'll give none. I may let you no, get to I'll more give of them. Three, or you can go fuck your tranny bitch, ho. Huh? There you go, there you go, and the mask falls off. The mask falls off. I knew it. Go ahead and add that number to the ban list. You obvious troll. I'm so I'm so sorry. So sad for you. Um, that <laughs> that is the way you go. You tried to play us. You are not bright enough to do so. You are not clever enough to do so. It was painfully obvious. And then you just pulled the mask down and showed that you're a raging bigot. So happy Pride Month. I have your phone number. Um, happy Pride Month. I have your phone number. Have a good month. All right. That's a, that's a good way to, to, to start the show off today. That was um, a delightful start. Yeah. Make sure we uh, get a get a screenshot, jot that number down, add it to the add it to the list. But uh, it's amazing, it, and it's funny because I have no idea whether this individual was a theist, a legitimate theist who may have had something important to say, or if they're just you know calling to get clips for a show or to hear themselves speak or waiting maybe he was just going to try and build up and do the you know your gay homie or whatever else floats their boat um but all right let's let's try this again hey everybody welcome to the sunday show where we've already had one incredibly generous caller who was magnanimous and lovely and uh did not last all that long because we're just terrible people who want to play on emotions but thanks so much for letting your mask fall down and adding your name to or your number uh, to my personal callback list uh, and ban lists. All right, so now we've got, uh, let's see. We, we we lost a theist while we were waiting around. Nashua in Texas, the Pantheist, welcome to the Space Show Online. How are you? I am, I'm doing fine, Matt. And I have a couple of evidences and arguments for the substance of the universe being God, perhaps. Uh, okay. Um, also, I'm me, sorry. Uh, um, uh, hello, Eric, too. Hello, Josh. Thank you. I'm sorry Thank about before, I, whoever no that was. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's nothing. Now, I want to I make sure uh, I want to make sure we understand. So you're calling in because you have um some sort of evidence about the substance of the universe and whether or not it's it's god what do you mean by the substance of the universe um <clears throat> okay uh that's a good way to start so um my position is the substance of the universe well actually that's explanation of what it does so the the and i don't want to get into too much of quantum mechanics because I know that can go into Good. places that we both obviously don't, you know, know. But the, the, basically, space time is made out of this substance that is called the quantum field, and that's all. That the universe is made out of the substance, the entirety of it. Uh, the evidence for that is that. Oh no, I was I was getting ahead of myself. Um, <clears throat> that, in my my view, is 
interconnected throughout the entirety of the universe, and we can discuss whether it's interconnected or not. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so we're, we're having little or problems with, with we're we're having little problems with with your audio where there's there's some choppiness or whatever else. But uh, I was able to understand most of that, except that you know you didn't want to get into quantum mechanics too much. But you're saying the substance of the universe is a quantum field that's still essentially kind of well right. it, it's it's so difficult to even address this um the the you are you suggesting that the quantum field is real and is the substance that makes up space time and you want to talk about that yeah oh, uh, it's more than uh, yeah i i'm not even suggesting i think that's a fact that the uh that the quantum field is the substance of the universe the, that makes up space, time, and the materials of the universe eventually. <clears throat> okay. That was uh, an experiment uh, done in a vacuum chamber uh, that showed evidence for the quantum field being real with particles popping in and out of existence. But I didn't want so, to get too far into that. We, because we, I we can have observations. We, we have observations right. of, uh, of what's been described as a quantum field. And then we have quantum field theory to, to attempt to explain those things. But, right. but it's weird for me to hear it called a substance. But, okay, how, how does that mm -hmm. relate to a god? Well, that alone doesn't relate necessarily. That doesn't relate to any mind or God or being at all, uh, alone by itself. Um, <clears throat> but uh, th there's other um, arguments with that that stack on top of it to get most of. The uh, I, no, absolute Joshua, I yes, I need you to actually so. Do you understand how to make an argument for something? Because it seems that yeah. you, because it seems that you don't, because you're saying that the quantum field is a substance that makes up space time and that you have evidence that this quantum field is in fact a God. And so when I ask how the mm. quantum field t ties to God, that's your opportunity to, to present your argument for the quantum field being okay. God. Okay. Yes, sir. So um, I'll, I'll go. Uh, do you mind if I well, okay. uh, go through Joshua, a couple? Joshua, Joshua, stop. Joshua, he, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. As soon as I'm done talking, you start. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Don't ask if you can do this other thing. Just make your state your case. What is your argument? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Hello? Eric, are you still there? I am still here, yes. Waiting. Joshua? This this is so weird. Can you weird. hear me now? I hear, I hear you now, Joshua. Go ahead. Uh, you're live on the air. Joshua, you're live on okay. the Sunday show on the line. Go the ahead. The substance of the universe makes forms all things intrinsic to their form. The space between the space time observed space time in gravity of body. Uh, we discussed that already. Interconnectivity evident of space time and the expansion of the universe. Um, the, the interconnectivity of the universe is evident with. Um, Space time because the whole universe is expanding, so everything's interconnected through space time. Um, <clears throat> and in part, you can go through entanglement to talk about interconnectivity, but that doesn't address the whole issue. Um, and then the universe is a container of information, uh, it contains all the information. Hang, hang on, in you're, it. You're, 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 are, are you calling in on a telephone or a cell phone or the computer? Oh, so unfortunately, I'm calling in through the website, and I think that's where most of my issues are coming. Yeah. Are you also reading from 
some site? No, I'm reading off of a paper, paper that I wrote. Uh, I think it's disingenuous just to read off of a site. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so what I've heard so far is that quantum field is a substance that makes and forms all things. Um, it's yeah, observable sure. in space time and the gravity of, I guess, stellar bodies and that the interconnectivity is evident from the expansion of the universe. No, nothing so far yes, sir. has anything to do with a God. Well, if you um, address the information issue, I, I then didn't, you I, have... No, no, Joshua, Joshua, I didn't even mention the okay. word information. I, I hadn't gotten to that because you just said that right as I was interrupting. And I do not accept the assertion that it's information. So... What what are we getting to? How is how is this interconnectivity that you're talking about and the quantum field? How is that God? Um. Well, <clears throat> it's a it's it's a property. And of course, all things are properties, but it's a property that allows it, whatever it is, something. The information in it, and it doesn't necessitate it doesn't necessitate uh, a mind to know all things. It doesn't necessitate a process, if you will, to know all things. So um, not only have you not only have you still not presented anything that comes close to a god, but it seems like you just said something that would be the exact opposite of God, because the the god typically is viewed as an agent mind. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm. I'm. I. Uh, I'm a pantheist in at, at heart. I'm not a. I'm not a theist. So my definition of God would be different from a theist. Like well, I don't what, have any. What is your definition of God? <clears throat> um, the substance of the universe that knows all things is in, interconnected through all things. Okay. So. So the substance of the universe that knows all things and yes and what is interconnected through and, and is interconnected through all things manifests all things okay define i'm i'm almost done mm -hmm. define things oh. because so so that hang would on be... I, I just want to be clear you you've defined your pantheistic yeah. god as the substance of the universe mm -hmm. that knows all things and is interconnected yeah. through all things now are is the word things yeah. in that definition does it mean the same thing both times or does one of those things mean something different than the other of those things well there's going to be a lot of you know, it's more like of all material things all energy things, all things that contain information, um, so that it would know minds because of the consequence of brains being uh, material and stuff like that. Too. Okay. So all things, everything. I, 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 but I'm, at one I'm gonna, time, not like I'm, it knows the future. Sorry. How how have you established this is a mind? Like if I were to grant you, if I were to grant you that yes, the universe, the universe is made out of substance or stuff. It's all interconnected, um, quantum field, mm -hmm. all that. Let, let's say I was just grant you all the quantum stuff you just kind of put out there for the sake of argument. How have you established okay. that this is a mind? It doesn't have to be a mind. Well, but you, you just does, you just it does if you use the word no. Yeah, you just you just established no, that it doesn't have to be a mind. But how do you know something without a mind? Because your definition of your God was a substance of the universe that knows all things. How do you know something without a mind? Because it's got static memory. It knows. Uh, it, uh, I'm not, my, the RAM in my computer it, it, doesn't not, know the data that's it, in there. It just stores it. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The, the RAM in my computer, the hard drive in my computer, doesn't know the things I put in it. It mm -hmm. just simply holds it. It's like a water jug. Fair. That's fair. No, okay. Although so, using processes, but yeah, that's fair. 
So, so perhaps, perhaps you're injecting God qualities into your definition by using, forgive me, sloppy language like knows instead of just contains. Right. Yeah, because if we were if we were to all well, agree, it, 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 I'm not saying we do agree, but I'm saying if let's imagine that all three of us agreed that the substance of the universe contained all knowledge, but that doesn't mean that the substance of the universe knows, because knowing is the act, as far as we can tell, of a, a of a mind. By entity. It, what? Right. Oh, I was going to say by an entity. Well, whether or not it counts as an agent or not, I mean, I, I would I would say that anything with a mind counts as an agent, but in a minimum, anything that knows has to be a mind. I don't know, you know, and you're 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 seem to be wanting the qual. As this is what Eric is pointing out. You, you seem to be wanting the qualities of a mind while saying it doesn't have to be a mind, and this is what's we're finding really confusing. Oh well. It it's not necessary that it's a mind. Um, it's just that um, the it point. It, it's kind of like a pointer to the fact that it has the capacity to to have a technically all things, like to hold all things. At least that we can observe, because we can't talk about what's outside the universe and stuff like that. I'm holding up. I, mean, I, I don't can, know if you can. It, be, I, I don't know if you can see me, um, but I'm I'm holding up a Bible. Yeah. This but this Bible. I can't see you. But okay. Fine. This Bible that I'm holding up contains all of the information um, that is the Bible. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But but this book doesn't know anything. Correct. Correct. Okay. So if we look at the universe. And we say the very substance of the universe contains all of the information about the universe. That's just a tautology. Yeah. If, if you look at the, it's, it's like saying the universe equals the universe, but you're pantheistically saying the universe equals God. And we need to know what you're adding to the universe to justify identifying it as a God. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um then I, I can I can um settle and concede as a natural pantheist then. <clears throat> um, so if you if you can concede to down to natural pan if you can concede down to natural pantheism, what pantheism. is pantheism giving you then? If there's no agency, no God, no supernatural, what what does the pantheist label give you at this point? Oh, there's still the um, it, it it's 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 hard to explain. Um, there's a can it be uh, can it be summarized as hope, meaning, or purpose? At all. Can can the pantheist label give you one no, of these three a things? And a divinity. It's a beauty and a divinity, like the universe. To me, I know you. I don't understand. I mean, I don't. You're, you're, I can't read you're your garbled. mind. Joshua, the whatever web interface they, they're using to call your garbled. Did you say that it's it's not hope, but it's beauty? It, and it, divinity? It, and that isn't that isn't an argument, but it is the way I view the universe. That it is but, beautiful. But isn't isn't beauty and a subjective isn't beauty a subjective assessment Absolutely. by the by the observer? Absolutely, and it's also so. True. It's it's not the universe that has possesses the quality of beauty. It's you look at the universe and you declare it beautiful. Yeah, and, and it me, me too. I to think me, the universe is, is incredibly beautiful in mo in most of it. I don't see why that justifies calling it God. And you also attach you also attach because divinity that's the, that's to that. The closest that would be the ahead, well, in a way, it's like saying that's the. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. There's, there's a delay. You're fine. Go ahead. Well, I would say that would be the closest. Um, I think currently we can get to calling something God is the universe. Well, why would you want to get close? 
Yeah, go ahead. I'm Why would sorry. you want to get close to calling something a god? It's okay, Matt. Because I mean, you you also because you mentioned beauty earlier, and you attached divinity. You said it's beauty and divinity, which I think divinity is bringing in some luggage yeah. that I don't think you can quite justify here. And you said that this is what gets us the closest to God. But why Why is that a requirement of describing the universe and appreciating it? Why do you have to have that in there? I don't have to have it. I want to have it. So yeah. it's just personal okay. preference. Why? You just want to classify the universe this way. Because I agree, the universe is beautiful. I love James Webb Space Telescope. I was probably one of the most excited people on the planet to see that thing launch and the pictures it's produced. Like, I love the universe. I don't need to attach godlike terms to describing it because that brings in all kinds of assumptions and luggage i don't need that why do you think you need it what does it do for you that the other words cannot the natural secular words cannot yeah c c I, I i don't know if your mic's cut out or, or what's going on we haven't awesome, yeah. even start to answer that but to me, uh, maybe this is an analogy. Um, yeah, w one one second. We hear you, Joshua. I, I want you to answer this because Eric's question is great. Why do you think you need this? But to me, it's a lot like looking uh, the, the old uh, canard of it's looking at a flower garden and saying, oh, these flowers are lovely. God must have done it. And what you're doing is you're looking at the universe and saying, oh, the universe is lovely. That must be God or as close as I can get to God. But you know no no offense i'm i'm always dubious about taking pantheistic and panentheistic calls um because every single time they advocate for a useless god or a useless approximation of a god um that doesn't impact what people think that doesn't you know people don't vote based on this they don't make decisions about other people's lives based on what the universe you know doesn't want uh but yeah I, I, to to face Eric's question, Joshua, why do you think neither of us need to, to get close to calling the universe God and you feel a need to get as close as possible to calling it God? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a kind of a different type of skeptic and my skepticism is backwards from most skeptics, which is if it's I not. see something faulty in something, that's when I dismiss it. That's when I dismiss it. If I see something faulty, in something, I dismiss it. Yes, but you've I'm, you've shifted you've shifted the burden of proof such that you'll believe anything is true until somebody gives you a reason not to. Well, I can give you reasons not to, and that is it hasn't been demonstrated to be true. What you've got here isn't skepticism. You've got credulity. Well, then, once one second. Um, so you believe that it must be demonstrated to be true for it to be true. No, I believe it must be demonstrated true before it's justified for me to believe it's true. It can be true and there not there's no demonstration, but if there's no demonstration, well, I don't have warrant to believe it. Well, if there's um and I don't personally own the metaphysics, but if there's metaphysics that shows something is true, and it's not necessarily demonstrated, but has evidence that it's true, even though it's technically unfalsifiable. Why can't I accept that as evidence for it to be true? You can accept whatever you want, but because, you don't get to pretend like you're being skeptical or that you have good reason. You've already admitted you don't have good oh, reason. You've, not, admitted, no. you, you've admitted that you call it that you that this is the closest approximation to God and that this is what you want. But what you want is independent from what it is. And, and so if we were to list the characteristics right. that might qualify something as a god, the universe doesn't have those. It has a couple. No, you listed, you listed beauty and divinity. Yeah. Where, where's your demonstration that a god is tied to beauty? Well, yeah, but the, the, the word god in all the gods that have been proposed are always... Um, subjective wow see now i think you you backed into a corner where now you're just going to throw out a word that makes no sense with the rest of the sentence i i the, the issue here was that you said it's close we get to god and beauty was your go-to first thing that you saw in the universe that you said pointed to yeah. god why on earth Absolutely. would you think that a god should be tied to beauty
let me rephrase Matt's question, maybe in a way that might help. Um, let's say it's hypothetically, necessary. it's not necessary that a god should be tied to beauty because there's so many. So, um, can I, can I ask I my follow-up question there, Joshua, beautiful. really quick? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to move ahead. on this point because I think ahead. there's. I think. I think. I think Matt's tapping into something pretty good here. Let me ask you it this way. Let's say hypothetically tomorrow we disprove the existence of any god. Don't ask us how we did it. We just did it, just hypothetically. We've demonstrated okay. beyond a shadow of a doubt that there are no gods. How would that affect your appreciation of the beauty of the universe? Uh, does everything I uh, said already uh, still exist? It it all still exists. Like we're still here. We we it, life's going on. Like yeah, then you know, I'm stock, fine. stock market's going to open up tomorrow. Is, that, I'm going to go to work. How how would what affect I, you? What I what I know you, from what I know, not what I assume, but what I know. Uh, if it's not God, then I'm fine with it because it's still beautiful. Okay, great. So so we've now divorced the idea of God being needed or wanted in order to appreciate beauty. And that's great because, I mean, yeah. here's a really short personal anecdote. One of the biggest things I had to overcome when I deconverted from Christianity was appreciating nature for nature's sake, for just the appreciation's sake. For, for most of my life, whenever I'd see a beautiful sunset or a meadow or something, under my breath, I would utter a little thank you to God. Thank you, God, for making this for me. Thank you, God, for giving this to me. It's so beautiful and divine. When I deconverted, one of my biggest challenges was looking at a sunset and going, wow, there's no one behind that. And it took me a little bit to come to the understanding it's still there. It's still beautiful. Nothing has been subtracted from it. In fact, I appreciate it more after I've learned science and the processes that went into creating these things, you know, creating naturalistically. I appreciated it more once I've removed the magic out of it and learned more about it. And so you and me, I appreciate the level you're at here. You want, you want something to be behind the beautiful things you see. You need to be careful though, that you don't inject or manufacture it because you're trying to satisfy some emotional need behind it just just accept reality on reality's terms and then you can learn to accept a genuine understanding of it a genuine appreciation of it without injecting any like you know fairies or magic behind it is what matt was referring to earlier that was a douglas adams quote yeah um yeah like you don't need god we've already i think we've already kind of established you out of your own mouth you don't need the god to appreciate the beauty so with that established start looking at yeah. why you you think you need the God and start examining that and figure out, okay, maybe you don't quite need that because it's not doing anything for you at this point. It's just extra baggage. It, um, I, it's not necessary for me to believe in a God. It is just, I am convinced for reasons that, that are not demonstrable. I'm convinced that it is it is deeper you're, than that. You're convinced for reasons that are not demonstrable. Why yeah. are you convinced not if demonstrable. you don't have demonstrable reasons? Okay. Well, he can't demonstrate. So yeah. it's weird to say that the reasons are non-demonstrable. Like you can't even tell what the reasons are? Well, there is, um, there's, every now and then I walk into metaphysical arguments that convince me. And okay. I'm taken aback because, uh, and sometimes I'm walking to, and it's like, like, well, for one, like, um, I know that nothing, it will, but you might have a different opinion than I do, but I don't know that not even God could create mathematics. It's like, a intrinsic to the existence of things was discovered because if one thing exists, it's immediately divisible, addable, multiplicable too. That's my opinion on mathematics, but, like um, there are like some people present mathematical uh, present metaphysics, and it's really interesting to look at. And it's some of it's there's convincing, all... even though nothing is like objectively there. And there's no material thing that's objectively there. It's really yeah. So Joshua, at. there are facts. There are mathematical facts that are discovery, but the language of mathematics, mathematics itself, is an invention of humans. And so I don't know how you reach the conclusion. Absolutely. I don't know how you reached a conclusion that God can't create math or or how you reached any conclusion about what God can or can't do 
when you don't have a belief well, in an well, ancient well, god? Well, I, I can tell you how I reached the conclusion what, what, what can't be done, regardless of God, is because um, it's, it's like asking, uh, can God create himself? And he can't create himself. He See, can't the, create the, himself. There's nothing uh, to no, create. No, the problem, right? is, the problem is, is that he, that's, I understand the, 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 I understand reaching that conclusion. But that conclusion necessitates that God is subject to reason. And yes, I don't, absolutely. I, and you say, uh, listen to you, listen to you, Joshua. You just said, yes, absolutely. To while yes. that is generally true amongst modern theologians and their perception of God, that is it, is it absolutely impossible that there could be something that would qualify as a God, which would not be bound to logic? How do you demonstrate that? Well, that I, I think that's undemonstrable, but you can come up with a hypothetical. No, no, no. Um, okay. This, this would, is what's would... so. Stop, Joshua. Stop. This is what's so frustrating. You just said it's absolutely, absolutely God mm -hmm. is subject to reason. And then you said you can't demonstrate that, but you can come up with a hypothetical. Do you understand how frustrating it is to hear someone say that something is absolutely the case and then say, well, you can't demonstrate it? You can only have a hypothesis. Do you realize that hypotheses need to be testable? So if you have a hypothesis that isn't testable, yeah, it's no uh, hypothesis hypothesis at all. And so here I am asking, trying to get, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on pantheism, which I genuinely don't give a shit about. Um, and, and it seems that it doesn't matter that much to you either. If you found that there was no God, it wouldn't change anything about your perception of the universe. And yet you keep making declarations about the qualities and, and ontolog uh, ontology of God and have no way to back it up, yet you're absolute, you express absolute confidence that it must be this way, and then when pushed, you have no demonstration and, and not, not even a testable hypothesis. Do you understand why that's frustrating? Did we lose you? You might be disconnecting again. I'll get a couple words into here while Josh is yeah, hopefully good. hearing us. So Josh, it, 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 it does appear you, there, there we go. It, it, it does appear that you're using two different processes to evaluate the universe. You're using you're using a more rational one for your everyday stuff, like if a salesman comes to your door wanting to sell you something, you'll probably evaluate that more critically than you are the God claim. But when it comes to the God claim, you are applying a completely different set of rules to it. You are uh, you are adopting belief on things that cannot be demonstrated or loose language. Um, kind of more on the emotional level of it. Why why are you operating under two different standards when only one is needed? Well, I want to answer that question, but I also want to answer Matt's response. Real sure, quick. go ahead. And the reason why I said yes, absolutely, is because nothing can violate the law of non-contradiction. That I, I mean, the, and that might be a rule of incredulity that there's something that violates the law of non-contradiction, but the, as far as I understand, nothing can exist and not exist at the same time. That's the only reason why I said yes, absolutely, you'd have to follow the laws of logic. Um, going back to air, unless Matt wants to push that into well, me. Um, here, here, here's the problem here. The, uh, is that, now, hang on. What you just said. Okay. I asked whether or not God was subject to logic, and you said absolutely. And then you just explained why. And that's because you use logic. You now have created a circular argument where you assume that yeah. God is subject to logic so that you can claim that God is subject to logic. Now, that would be circular reasoning. I recognize, I recognize that I use logic to um, confirm logic. And I no, understand that no, that's not, that's not what you did. That's, no, that's not what you did. That's not what I'm saying. You're not listening. You created Go a ahead. circular argument to demonstrate that God would be subject to reason. And that is fallacious. If you were using logic, you would not be presenting fallacious arguments for your position. Matt, um, what, what could violate the law of non-contradiction? I, I, well, thank you 
for presenting yet another fallacious argument and another demonstration that you don't understand logic. I'm objecting to the fallacy that you used. Asking me what could violate the law of non-contradiction is completely irrelevant. A, it's irrelevant whether or not I know of anything, which I don't, and B, it's irrelevant whether or not anything could be, because that is at the level of logic, and this is whether or not God can be superior or outside the bounds of logic. You used logic to say that God... You used you used a circular argument to assume that logic is primary and foundational beyond God. And I'm saying you don't get to do that. Now, do you have a non-fallacious response? Because if you're just floundering, we can move on to the next point or the next call. It's it's I understand why it's fallacious. I just don't understand why it's not logical. So um, that, that I no, I'm going to stop, Joshua. Or... Joshua, I'm muting you right now, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to let you go. And I want you to go off and think about this, because you, you the words that came out of your mouth, which I will probably paraphrase because I'm not going to get them literally correct, is that you understand why it's circular, but you don't understand why it's not logical. That is an epic failure, an epic failure to understand lot to, to utter the phrase that you understand that something is a fallacious circular argument and then say, I don't know why it's not logical is to demonstrate that you lack a sound foundation in logic. You are a being as self-contradictory as the argument that you presented tried to be in self-affirming. Okay. I want you to go off and think about that. Call us back some other time. When you get to where you can present a logically sound, non-fallacious argument for a god. Thanks. That ties in. That ties into what I was asking him a little earlier too about. He's got two different epistemologies. He has one he's applying to everything else, most likely, and the special one that he's applying to things that he either doesn't have all the information on, can't understand, or has an emotional need one of those three or all three of them. Um, yeah. Joshua, that, that I know you're not here anymore. I don't want to talk to you when you can't respond, but that's, that is, that's going to open you up to all kinds of mistakes and false conclusions because you are applying two different standards to the way you evaluate the world, one for everything else around you and then one for this God thing. And if you want to better address the questions that Matt brought up, take elements from your standard epistemology, the ones you, you use every day when you're critically thinking about whatever you deal with here on planet Earth, take those and adopt those into your other epistemology and keep on going until you answer these questions. And before you know it, those two epistemologies will become the same because we should have a unified way. Every one of us should have a unified way of looking at the universe. Because if you don't, and you have this other special thing that you use in order to talk about this special thing, we're talking about special pleading at this point. And at that point, anything can go, anything can be explained, anything will fly. It, it, it's not the way to come to a more accurate understanding of our reality. So yeah. did appreciate when the call though. The, um, yeah. yeah, thank you. And yeah. when you get to the point where, where you're willing to say, I know the argument's fallacious, but I accept it anyway, or I know the argument's yeah. fallacious, but I, I don't understand why that makes it Ill illogical or inconsistent with logic. When we yeah. say that something is, first of all, I hate the I hate the term logical, but I understand it's in, it's in common parlance, so we'll stick with it. Um, I think when when we when we say that something's logical, what we mean is it is logically sound. It is in keeping with the best practices of applying logic, or it might be better to say it is rational. It is it is not consistent with the best logical practices for something to be fallacious. It, you can't have a a logical a, a sound argument that is fallacious. You can't. You can't, can't have a valid argument that's fallacious. Validity tends to go to structure and soundness goes to to the, whether or not the, the premises are true um, or accepted as true, I guess is, is, is a better way to put it. So it's, I, I don't mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that when you look around the world, it's intriguing um, and beautiful. And I'm sure that quantum mechanics um, awes you. But when you start off by suggesting that there's a quantum field, which is the substance of everything and contains information, and you create a tautology, 
where you've just defined God as the substance of the universe. And, and that's basically what you did was you said, here's what I'm going to say is the substance of the universe. And I'm going to define God as the, literally your definition of God was the substance of the universe that knows all things and is interconnected through all things. Um, which by the way, the, the, the fact that there, there's a, a perspective which would allow you to view physical objects is entirely connected through the expansion of the universe doesn't mean that they are in fact connected in any meaningful way. It also doesn't mean just because they contain information or possess all information doesn't mean that they know anything. And when you define pantheistic God beginning with the substance of the universe that, your argument became circular as well. So your your main argument was circular, then your follow-up argument was circular. And then when, when this gets pointed out, you're like, oh, I know it's circular. I don't know why that's a problem. That The problem is right there, that you don't know why it's a problem. And it's a problem because if an argument is circular, then you cannot show that it is true. It doesn't matter that you can't show it's false. You, you can't show it's true. And when you reply with, well, show me something that can violate the law of non-contradiction, um, that is also a fallacious argument where you're implying that the inability to show something means that it does not exist or that it cannot exist. That's, that's a, a fallacy as well. So it's like a, a parade of stuff. I appreciate the, you know, the attempts and it's nice to get something other than, you know, um, y Yahweh defenders, but you know, let's, let's be honest here. Virtually nobody really has a strong, connection to the God that he was advocating, um, you know, don't vote yeah. on it. That's, they're not going to be like calling into troll about anti pride stuff or any of that over it, but it's yeah, still pantheism, intriguing. Pantheism makes a lot fewer, uh, con concrete claims than, you know, your typical theist does, but it's, uh, and yeah, using invoking quantum physics, talking about all that, kind of laying that groundwork. You're you're creating this like kind of cloudy environment where ghosts can lurk, and you can just kind of latch on to one of them to make an explanation to explain something that's unknown. And yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, quantum physics is really spectacular. And who knows? I mean, maybe God's in there somewhere, and we'll discover him one day. I don't think that will actually happen, but it's not impossible. It's 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 really difficult because it's like you 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 want to engage and you want to have like a conversation about things we understand and things we know but then you're talking about quantum physics which no one in this call understands it very deeply it's it, it's like it's, it's it kind of becomes a fruitless conversation because you can't establish any concrete facts you can't establish anything solid to build off of it's, it's all just fuzzy and it's like building a house on sand um and yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fun exercise, but you know, it's, it, you can't get very far with it. You can't, you can't really build anything or make any progress because it's, you're always going to go back to what if one of our fundamental, fundamental premises is flawed because, you know, quantum something it's a, yeah, good exercise, but it's it also does get a little tiring after a while. And, and one of the big points that Eric made that we didn't really get to, um, and, and probably several others was what does calling the universe God or identifying the universe God gain us what has been added there beyond whatever the universe is um, to say, you know, Oh, I'm going to call my second pair of glasses. God. Okay, cool. I can do that. I can even pray to these glasses. It would be really kind of silly of me to do so, but um, what does calling it God add to it that benefits us? Is there, yeah, and, and or, or you could look at it in an entirely different way. If we just call this glasses and don't call it God, what have we removed that is true and beneficial? Mm -hmm. So it, it's like you can, you could call anything God and, and you yeah. could have compelling personal reasons to do so. It's just, you know, I, I just care I kind about of, the truth stuff. That reminded me of, of the caller Wade from, um, the the hang up from a couple of weeks ago the zoroastrian guy who yeah. tragically came ac across really hard times in life and he picked up zoroastrianism and the be excellent to each other kind of philosophy behind it and says i got better and we established that hey you don't need that why do you still have it and then at that point the conversation broke down because even though he was able to divorce the utility of, of the one over the other 
you couldn't explain why he needed the Zoroastrianism. And and same thing here with with Joshua. He, <laughs> He's acknowledging the beauty of the universe. He's we're able to get him to redefine it to a point where you don't need a mind. At that point, is why do you need divinity? Why do you need that special God sauce in there when it's not doing anything for you, other than I'm assuming fulfilling some emotional need like I had when I deconverted. Um, so yeah, it's if it's useless, dump it because it's just going to cloud conversations. People like me and Matt. Joshua will just pick it apart because if you can't show it to be true, we're just going to, we're going to be all over that because that's what we do. <laughs> so we got a load of callers, including theistic callers here waiting. And this next one is a question that I've had, I don't know, countless people call into shows to ask. And I've answered it so many times that I really just want to hear uh, what Eric has to say to, to this caller. So Ryan in Canada, a theist struggling with whether or not he's an atheist, pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the Sunday show on the line with Eric. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, wishing Matt a happy Sunday, wishing Eric a happy Sunday, and wishing all of thanks. the uh, listeners a happy Sunday as well. Thanks. Well, thanks. What can I do for you? Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm struggling with the uh, uh, the idea of atheism uh, internally. It's uh, it's really bugging me, and I'm, I'm hoping you guys can help me out. Um, sure. And uh, 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 essentially, uh, I, I've arrived at a viewpoint, and I'm not sure if it's uh, atheistic or not. Um, uh, uh, am I able, able to describe this to you guys? Uh, sure. Let me let me ask you one quick question, and then I'll let you go into sure. your description, um, just so I have a groundwork to, to build off of when I'm discussing this, this with you. So atheism is, or atheist, atheism talks about one thing, and that is a person's belief or not in a god. So can you tell me, yes or no, do you believe a God exists? And if, it, if you say, I don't know, or I'm struggling with it, that's a totally fine answer. But yes, no, I'm not sure. Do you believe a God exists? Uh, yes, and I'm struggling with it. Okay, yes, and you're struggling with it. Okay, go ahead and go into what you were about to mention. Okay, so uh, uh, what I've arrived at is that uh, reality is a mathematical construct, uh, essentially an, an equation that's playing out. And uh, th that mathematical truth represents uh, absolute truth. So we can look to mathematics to, to identify truth. Uh, and, and what I've arrived at is that uh, moral truth is a representation of ma mathematical absolute truth. Uh, and, and that's what I'm looking at as God right now. But uh, that, that's the, the point where uh, I, might, I might need a little bit of help. Okay. So. You started with reality is a mathematical construct. What do you mean by construct? Um, well, uh, mathematics represents uh, truth in the universe. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, truth remains constant through time and space in the universe. One plus one will always equal to two. Uh, and uh, uh, the way that I like to look at it is that every time we uh, we reveal a mathematical truth or a scientific truth, we, we're revealing one more of God's truths. Okay. Well, before we jump to the God thing, um, you're 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 describing mathematics as it's something that exists outside of subjective perception, right? Matt mentioned it earlier, mathematics is a human invented language for us to describe how we observe the universe to be, right? So the universe, let's kind of walk through it here. Do you agree with me that the universe has properties? Yes, correct. Okay. The that universe, can be described as true or false. Okay, sure. The universe operates consistently. Correct. Yes or no? Okay. Yes. Um, Humans have used mathematics. We invented that language for us to describe the way the universe interacts with itself, with physics, uh, with you know, adding, subtracting, all that. So you, you are taking, I think, the whole idea of mathematics as a human invented construct or a language and reverse applying it back to what it's describing. 
And you're kind of transferring some attributes from mathematics back towards the universe when it doesn't go that way. Is that, am I misrepresenting you uh, here? Yeah, that, that doesn't make sense to me. The, the reason why I say that is that mathematical truth existed uh, before humans did. Uh, essentially, we came on and we discovered mathematical truths. Right. So the universe is what it is before humans came along, is what I just heard. Right. Okay. So how do you go from that? You mentioned God in the last statement you said. So how, how are we going from that to a God must be there? Yeah, so um, the way I'm looking at it is that uh, uh, human consciousness can essentially be, essentially be um, uh, reduced to uh, a mathematical equation that's playing out. Um, and uh, what I'm seeing there is that uh, uh, absolute mathematical truth is uh, representative of absolute moral truth. Um, how, do you, how do you make the jump from objective reality, objective truths in the way reality presents itself to now we're talking about morality? Like, how do you make that jump, that connection there? Because that, that's a huge leap. We're now talking about two completely different things. Yeah, so uh, uh, our, our morality um, or, or, or our consciousness is essentially a, a, a collection of truths that we've accumulated uh, over the years. Um, so it, in a sense, it represents uh, an absolute truth, but only a, a subset of God's absolute truth that we're able to perceive. Um, well, hold on. You, you just injected God back in there. We're, we're trying to make okay, that I'll try, connection. I'll try to avoid doing that. Okay. So to, to, to kind of address what you just said, consciousness is an emergent property of our brains, right? And I agree that, hey, consciousness comes down to our minds, which comes down to our brains, and our brains are physical and bound by physical laws and physical reality. So again, the universe is what it is. It operates by rules, and those rules have allowed us to become what we are. Not at any intent, it's just we're just the result of that in motion. Right. So how are you taking that and going to God? So uh, uh, within our brains, we're going to have uh, uh, certain psychological constructs that uh, that exist there. Uh, one of them is going to be our conscience, uh, our consciousness. Uh, our, our conscience is going to be tied to um, uh, feelings of guilt. Uh, uh, and, and those type of uh, emotions as well. Um, but uh, essentially what our, uh, our conscience is doing is it's evaluating uh, our construct of truth that we've, uh, that we've developed and um, uh, essentially uh, arriving at um, an answer based on uh, our understanding of truth that we've observed uh, in reality uh, and, and our and our understanding of uh, good and evil and right from wrong. So, so you you describe consciousness as essentially an object, as it's like a, a thing that exists in the universe. I think that's where we're going to diverge here because I don't view consciousness as some objective object that you can hold and examine and do things with. It is it is an emergent property of our brain. It's like it's like describing. That car goes fast, therefore fast is an object in the universe, or it's something we can like, you know, examine as such. Well, I think that's where uh, we're going to diverge there. Well, well, our consciousness would basically be just a, a set of electrical impulses that are happening uh, within our brain. It happens according to a specific pattern, um, and uh, as, as I guess an, we don't fully emergent... uh, understand it. As an emergent property of our brain, we call that consciousness. But the actual firing of electrons and electricity going through our synapses, it itself is not consciousness. We look at that process and we describe that as the functions of the brain. And as such, the consciousness is an emergent property of that. The same way that like a, a, a car, like you can break a car down to all of its parts and you can call that, you know, that's a pipe, that's a motor block, that's a tire. You know, there's parts to it. When you put it together and it becomes a car and that car goes fast, you're, no, you're not creating new objects in the universe. You are describing the function of all of the, those things together is what I'm getting at. 
So you're trying to take consciousness and jump from consciousness. Hey, consciousness exists. Now we are talking about, okay, uh, start putting a God in there because this thing exists and we have, you know, uh, we questions around it. But like I said, the same way this, ca calling consciousness a thing is the same way as calling fast a thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's a property of something that we put together. It's a description we have of it. It's not an actual object we can, you know, make such claims about. So let me let me ask you: Can our can our consciousness be reduced to uh, just those electrical pulses and those pathways that exist in our brain? Can our consciousness be reduced to just that? Um, As it exists within reality. If you start taking parts away, you'll lose the consciousness. But I don't know if you can like reduce it down to that. Like you think of it this way, okay? Like let's say let's say I were to scan my brain atom by atom, and I knew exactly the configuration of my brain down to the position of every single atom. And I had a machine that could create a new brain atom by atom and make a copy of me. And that thing, you know, it's in a body, got up, talks, looks in, or talks just like me, behaves just like me. Did we just create another consciousness in the universe as like we created another object, or are we? Do we just like set up another machine that is functioning the same way that I am functioning? I, I'd like to argue that we set up another machine. What are your thoughts? I'm a determinist, but we like but anyway. We don't get down that rabbit hole. What I'm what I'm getting at is a consciousness is the emergent property of the brain. I think I've said about twice now. If we set up a whole other brain, just like mine exactly the same it's going to operate and behave the same way mine does and as we interact with that individual that individual can be described as having a consciousness because it is taking in information interacting outputting information but because we have that doesn't mean we created a new object in the universe we created another thing that behaves as a consciousness does or, or it 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 it, it, it just, it, 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 it's emergent property is a consciousness. I, we're kind of down the weeds here, but. I, I do agree with the last statement yeah. you made. I, I'm saying that uh, uh, if we made an exact copy of you atom by atom, we're just going to have another object in the universe. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm just one, one, one more physical item is what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say. Well, no, you wouldn't have an, so all the objects are, are a collection of other objects. So what you would have is a new pattern. You didn't add anything to the universe. You just rearranged the universe so that a pattern is replicated. Fair enough. I, I'm confused as to, and, and I, you know, I bound out of this at the beginning because you were calling into struggling whether or not you were an atheist. And yeah. to me, the only question to answer is, are you convinced that a God exists? And if the answer is yes, you're a theist. And if the answer is anything other than yes, you're an atheist of some variety. Um, I, I don't know. You're, you seem to be tying notions of consciousness to concepts of good and evil, which I, don't, which I consider is nothing more than abstracts and labels that we apply to things um, where something is good if it conforms to this standard that we're doing. It's, you know, it's like good moves in chess and bad moves in chess. They're not... Um, they're not intrinsically uh, good. They are the assessments based on the goal that we set of not losing the game. But I don't know what that has to do with whether or not you're an atheist. Yeah, uh, just kind of finish out your thought there, Ryan. Are you are you basically trying to say because we have a consciousness and we adopt a moral system with our consciousness, that somehow ties back to a god? Is that where you're kind of trying to drive this? Um. All right. Let me uh, let me see if I can approach it from a different angle. So, um, uh, I believe that God is mathematical truth in the universe. Now, that doesn't lend Why? itself towards Why? good or evil. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, hang that on. doesn't. Do you? Hang uh, on. Hang on, Ryan. Do you think yes. that mathematical truth in the universe is a conscious agent with will and power to do things? No. Then you're back to the same pantheistic bullshit we just dealt with. Yeah, you're applying characteristics to something that's you, not justified. You, you can, you can, ev whether or not there's mathematical truths in the universe, which it doesn't matter at this point, calling them God is no different from calling the universe God or calling a pair of glasses God. If you're not, if you're not advocating for a God that is a thinking agent, that has desires, that has a will, that does things, 
then you're advocating for an entirely useless God. What does saying that you think mathematical truths are God, what does that add that is in any way true and useful? And if, in fact, we were just to say they're just mathematical truths, what's missing by not adding the God label? We literally just went through this in the last call. All right. So um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, that uh, that mat mathematical truth is what I believe to be God. Now, um, good and evil did not so, exist so before human so beings. So you're not going to you're not going to listen to me or answer the question that I just asked. You're just going to repeat um, yourself. I will. I will I definitely attempt to answer the question as best as I can, Matt. Because you didn't at all, and it's really annoying because I sat here and waited and waited and waited, and you said, you believe that mathematical truths are God. And I said, why? And I said, what do we get by adding God, the label, to mathematical truths? And what would we be missing if we don't add mathemat a God to the label mathematical truths? And you literally started by saying that what you're trying to say is that you believe mathematical truths are God. How is that in any way an attempt to answer the question and not just a way to restate what you've already restated three or four times now? What do we get by adding the God label to mathematical truth? Okay, uh, I fully apologize, Matt. Um, as I indicated, I am struggling with this topic a little bit. Uh, please allow me to answer. I'm going to try to answer quickly. Um, what do we get? Um, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, we get a, a moral absolute truth that we are able to derive from mathematical truths. Now, also what I'm saying is that that moral, ab that moral absolute truth, it exists only inside of the human brain. Good and evil on only exists within the human brain, and it, it exists differently for e each and every person. And, and that's what I'm struggling with, Matt. So this is getting back to the consciousness thing. Hum good and evil don't exist as objects in the universe, and they don't exist in the brain. And absolute right. truths don't exist doesn't. only inside a human brain. You literally said that what we get by adding the God label to mathematical truths is that we get moral, moral absolute is that we get moral absolute truths, which isn't true. That's an assertion you haven't justified it. Adding the God label to it doesn't tell us anything at all about morality or moral absolute truths. But then you said that we get moral absolute truths that exist only inside a human brain. Yes, which is the. Uh the idealized form of, uh, of absolute truth that exists as a no, psychological no, construct no, that we no, aspire no, to. No, 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 no. The human brain does not contain absolute truth. It, no, it doesn't brain, contain absolute truth, but the concept that exists within the human brain that we aspire stop, to. Stop, Ryan. You literally said that by adding God to the, to the mathematical truth term, that what we get are moral absolute truths that exist only inside a human brain. And now you're saying absolute truths, like I just said, don't exist inside a human brain. So what do we get by adding the God label to mathematical truth? What we get is an, uh, an idealized absolute moral truth that exists for us. Um, and it's what we aspire towards or what we reach towards every time we discover a mathematical or a scientific truth. No, you truth. don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Here, I'm going to add, I, I, I'm just going to say mathematical truth is God. I now agree with you. How did that inform me about anything at all related to an idealized moral truth? Well, there's a... Our, our, our brains are essentially calculators. There's a calculation going on inside of our brain, and we're going to determine uh, good and evil, uh, right from no, wrong, sir. inside of our brain. No, sir. Please pause and think for a minute. I'm being very specific with this question because I'm tired of the nonsense. I'm now agreeing with you. Moral truth equals God. What can you directly arrive at? What conclusion can you reach? about morality what moral absolute truth can you reach from saying m m mathematical truths are god i'm going to say it once more what moral absolute truth give me one one moral absolute truth that can be derived from mathematical truth equals god uh we should not hurt we should not hurt children what what how did you get to that 
None of those words or concepts exist in either the term mathematical truth or the term God. What I'm saying is that there's math happening in our brain that leads us to the conclusion that we should not. No, sir. No, sir. I'm going to be a stickler for actually what was said and constructing an argument. Mathematical truth equals God. What moral absolute truth can we derive from that? And you said we shouldn't hurt children. Please construct a valid and sound argument that begins with the premise, mathematical truth equals God, and leads to the conclusion that we shouldn't hurt children. And you know why I'm not going to let you bother doing? Because it is fucking possible because a valid and sound syllogism has connected terms, and none of the terms in your conclusion exist in the premise, which means it is impossible for you to construct an argument that goes from that premise to the conclusion. Does that make sense? But it is the truth that we should not hurt children. Hold on. Okay. Matt, Matt just, Ryan, Matt just, Matt just, I'm completely done with you. Eric, you can let him go whenever you want. Matt, How Matt, dare you? Matt here, How dare you Matt, get walk through that and then pretend that there's still some absolute truth? I'm sorry that you don't understand logic, but I took every opportunity to very carefully show you what needs to be done to construct a syllogism, and you decided to bunt and restate the same bullshit. I, I have no patience for that. Ryan, you understand propositional well, logic, I assume, right? You, like, you understand the concepts of it, creating a syllogism, setting up premises, into a conclusion, right? The uh, basic framework, yeah. Okay, and that's fine. That's all you really need. Um, so you're, you're trying to establish that mathematical truth is God as one of your premises in that argument, all right? Matt, for the sake of argument, said, I'll grant you this as true, even though we could go back and say, how did you establish this as true before you can use it in this more complex argument? But we'll just simply say for right now, yeah, this will accept this is true. How does that get you to, therefore, we shouldn't injure or hurt children? Because your premise is talking about mathematical truth and God, and your conclusion is talking about hurting children. So what argument can you construct that is both valid and sound that will lead you from that premise, among others, to that conclusion? That's what Matt's asking. Yeah, so, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, the human brain is uh, essentially a calculator that's, that's able to process truth by examining truths within, uh, within our world, within our reality. And we use that to formulate uh, morality within our brains uh, there's a psychological construct within our brains, which is an, uh, uh, an idealized absolute moral truth. It exists. We cannot attain it, but we know it exists as fact. Okay. And I'll, I'll we try you. to align our conscious with that idealized truth as best we can. Okay. I'll grant you all that for the sake of argument. How does that get to don't hurt kids? Well, uh, we look at morality is, is, and is, uh, morality is essentially a, uh, an equation that's being uh, crunched within our brains, and we're going to come to the conclusion it's either true or false that the statement we should not hurt kids is is is, is applicable, and that's going to go deep. That's going to affect our conscious. That's going to affect our guilt. That's Ryan, going to okay, affect hold on, Ryan. Ryan, let's let's take a moment here. By what you're saying, you 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 aren't making that connection from all these premises, and you shouldn't hurt kids. And if you can't make that connection then I'm just as valid or I'm just as justified in saying, therefore, you should hurt kids. Like, you, you have not supported your conclusion at all with anything you're saying. You're saying that, that mathematical truth is God, consciousness exists in our brain, we formulate moral truths in our brain, I think is the way you put it, and then you started going off more, but none of this is leading to, therefore, you shouldn't hurt kids. Because I could, I could on the flip side, say, be using the exact words you're using, all of this gobbledygook and saying, and then that means you should hurt kids. So what, where's, where's the connection you're making with your conclusion? Because right now, none of your words in your conclusion, mainly hurt and kids, are appearing in anywhere in your premises. Uh, okay, let me take just one step basically... backwards. I would want to say that our consciousness acts as a, uh, an equation that's working out uh, over time um One a, a very very hello 
Yeah, I'm, yep. I'm putting that, a clock that gave on you a this. I, I got lots of other callers that I may not be as irritated with. There's one minute left for you to make a point and answer the question. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'm sending a message of love and acceptance out to all of the callers. Uh, I think it's oh, fuck important yourself, as a Ryan. psychological construct. You don't get your minute. I think he was going to mathematical truths is God. Our brains formulate moral truths based on these mathematics and this religion. I feel like we shouldn't hurt kids, and that's coming from my brain. Therefore, we shouldn't hurt kids. I, I got a feeling that's the direction he was going in. It, um, it's Yeah. My it's apologies to anybody who desperately needed to hear something for the 27th time. And the smug little, oh, thanks for listening to me. Let me just send out love to everybody. Uh, I, I can't take it. I genuinely can't take it because you are, you've called in to ask something. And we have both tried in multiple different ways. We, we have our, our different takes on it. We're doing everything we can to try to, to, to make this clear. And then even when Eric asked if you understood the basics of, of logic, and, and he said he did, it's clear that that's simply not true. It is simply not true that that caller understood the basics of yeah. logic. Basically, Ryan, you were establishing this really complex argument. If A, then B, if B, then C, if C, blah, 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 blah. Nowhere in there do you mention Z. And then in the conclusion, you're saying, therefore, Z. When you haven't even described Z in any of your premises, like it, it's, it's a non sequitur straight up you should probably right my recommendation is start looking at the reality as concrete objects and abstract objects properties and 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 properties of objects or i'm sorry objects and properties of those objects differentiate those in your mind consciousness is not an object in the universe good and evil are not consciousness or good and evil are not objects in the universe you're treating these as all as if they are all actual things we can like pick up and examine and and and, and treat all the same when we really can't. We, we we need to differentiate the way we treat these things because there are concrete objects and abstract objects, so on and so forth. So try to pull those apart, try to kind of look at it a little bit better and you know refine what you're trying to go for there. Biggest thing, and let me make a couple of announcements and we'll get on to some more calls. A number one. Um we want to have the best conversations that we can, but that requires that people actually listen to think about and answer the question that you're actually asked. There's a reason why we ask the questions that we're asking. They're there so that we can gain a better understanding. So the audience can gain a better understanding. And so that you can gain a better understanding. If you say you convinced that mathematics, mathematical truths are God. Cool. What does that mean? What does adding the word God label to it? Tell us, because the truth is what was happening right then is that you have in your mind a package of moral things that you associate with God for reasons that have nothing to do with whether or not God is mathematical truth. You have a package of moral beliefs that you think are tied to God. And then you insert those in without justification. If somebody else also believed that mathematical truth equals God, and they believe that God wants people to harm kids, they have just as good an argument as you do, because the statement, the, the beginning premise, mathematical truth equals God, doesn't tell you anything at all about kids or harm to kids or moral values or anything like that. And the truth is that despite the fact religions have co-opted their take on morality, morality is not in any way dependent on or contingent upon religion. And on that note, we have caller Pete, uh, pronouns are he, him, and theist. Hey, how's it going, uh, pretty good. He says, you wanna know how atheism can reconcile with morality given that morality is a religious concept, except that morality is not a religious concept. It's just because religions make claims about all kinds of things doesn't mean that they own the concept. Religion makes claims about love, but love isn't a religious concept, is it? I mean, it can be. It depends on how you understand love, right? Like, um, yeah, okay. Well, if you're not going to be on, if you're not going to be on exactly. the outset, this is really not going to go well. Is no, I, love? I, if, you, if you mean, hang on, emotion, hang on, love is an emotion, hang on. No. I'm not going to give you Sorry. anything if you're not going to be honest from the outset. Is love necessarily a uniquely religious concept? 
Yes. Wow. Please justify so, if so before there was any religion, there was no love? Yeah. I'm sorry. And before there was any religion, I mean religious beliefs, but the things the religious refer to are still religious, right? God exists whether or not did, there was any humans who exist. When did the first religious belief come into being or, or become a thing? Whenever human beings um, came to acquire more knowledge. Came so before they acquired acquire that knowledge, knowledge, did they have a concept they love? of love? I, 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 can't, I can't really answer that because... Uh, I mean, uh, because it would show that you were absolutely wrong and dishonest, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, I'm imagining a caveman and his his partner in a cave. They're completely indifferent towards each other, and then the first religious thought ever pops into his head, and all of a sudden, he, now he loves his partner in that cave. That's that's essentially no, no, I, the I, scenario I, I right. you described right. here. There, there's something that's analogous to love, even. For cavemen, the affection they have for right. each other, the desire to procreate, okay. so can we, create children. Can we agree upon? Can we agree upon that that love and or religious thoughts are not related to each other? You can have one without the other. Yes, that's correct. And okay. the same thing is true for morality, right? I don't believe so. Okay, so you don't think those same two cave people could say, hey, you shouldn't do that because it's wrong. They shouldn't. They they don't have a concept of fairness. They don't have a concept um of they can love but they can't care enough about someone else to realize that they don't want them to see harm All right, you got to be kidding they can't have a concept they can't have a concept of wrongness that's not religious because Bullshit. wrongness itself Bullshit. no 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 no, no, no. that is a, just an absolutely dishonest assertion i i don't have any religion i have concept the concept of morality ties to whether or not an action is consistent with a goal that's it. And as long as you have, a, you, as long as you care about other people, you can have a goal to not want them to see harm. And you could, you, when you, when a caveman got into a fight with another caveman because they were encroaching on their property, you don't think in their head there was a concept that it was morally wrong for them to encroach on their property? I think by the time they were able to make a recognition of that, they had a concept of wrong in a moral sense that's religious. I, no, I you're wrong. You, you, you are wrong. You, you are you are demonstra you are demonstrably wrong, and you are arguing dishonestly. The, the, can I, can I you are I, saying say you are saying no. I'm still talking. You are saying that without religion, no one could have a thought about whether or not an action that impacted them was good or bad. Yes, that's correct. If there you're, was, you are wrong. You are wrong and stupidly so. You are stupidly can, wrong can I, here. I'm not saying I'm not saying you're a stupid person. I'm saying you are stupidly wrong. And what I mean by that is you are so embedded to this I tied to this idea that religion necessarily has a, 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 is is tied to religion and morality are necessarily tied together that you can't even see that a person let, let's say we put two people right now who are two babies on a deserted island and we don't teach them anything at all about religion. They are still going to learn how to work cooperatively, and they are still going to have feelings of, you did me wrong without that religion. We know because this is how societies are built. This is the reason why we began to have laws and cultures, because we perceived what people were doing was wrong. The notion that you can't have that without religion is bizarrely stupid. I mean, I, I agree that with, without teaching them religion, without like they, they, they might not have a taught sense of religion, but they have some sense of religious belief. Even babies. No, 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 have, they don't. don't have you don't get no, Pete, Pete. No, Pete. You don't get to reject the premise just because you don't fucking like it. Well, I'm, I want to give you the reason for why I conclude that, and it's not because I don't like it. But it, it doesn't is. matter if you can. It, it, it doesn't matter if you can demonstrate why you believe it. If we can come up with a counterexample to disprove it, that defeats you. It's done. So, yeah, but and you've already that. admitted no, no, that putting two people reason, on that island. Exactly no, we, we, you already admitted that putting two people on that island, they would have moral thoughts. They would also have religious thoughts. Religion is universal. No, they like wouldn't. You, you don't amazing. know that they would have religious well, thoughts. I know that because when you look at humanity, humanity universally has come up with an idea of religion. 
No, it no, it hasn't, Pete. Have you ever heard? Have you ever heard of Pete? Have you ever heard of the Paraha? Now, I'm not too familiar with them, but I'm sure if you actually looked at the beliefs, you see like spiritual beliefs, Pete, other other aspects. Either. No, Pete, you're no, Pete, you're they now have in the realm. no god concept and no religion. But go ahead, Eric. You're now, you're now in the realm of claiming that you know the thoughts of every single human on the planet. Well, I mean, I, well, I, mean I, I can observe that from reading about what other humans say, what they write. Like the reason for why I said morality is a religious concept. If you look it doesn't at matter how much you read. Morality, it's not gonna, it doesn't matter how much you read. You're not going to be able to tap into the thoughts of every single human on the planet. Let me ask you well, this. I, mean, I don't need to start with skepticism. You, you, I can still make an abductive think, conclusion. Uh, no, no, no. Mm. No, you can't because you don't even know what that is. Okay. But as I said, can I just can I just state my reasons? Like I, I feel like you're you're Go, criticizing an idea which I haven't even had a chance to even like indicate why. You did indicate now, why. You you it says here the call screener says how can atheism reconcile itself with morality given that morality is a religious concept? But we reject your premise of your question. Morality is not a religious concept. While religions have can have. Um, views about morality and morality can be tied to religion. It is entirely possible for non-religious individuals and people without adhering to religion to have thoughts about morality, period. That's just yes, demonstrably yeah, true. Concept, but I don't think you can actually reconcile that with atheism. Hey, Pete, here's another thing. I, I can, because you just did it. You just agreed with me that people can have moral concepts without a religion, and that would make it atheistic. But not, not, not in a way that's consistent with that. You can have contradictory beliefs. Atheists can have contradictory consistent. beliefs. Consistent. I, I, this isn't about contradictory beliefs. Pete, your mind is on fucking 500-mile-an-hour I mean, train wreck exactly. right now. Your mind is on a 500-mile-an-hour train wreck right now. You're trying to get to three conclusions before you've established a premise. So we're going to start over. Hi. Okay. Pete, Pete's calling. Oh, Pete's a theist from can Philadelphia. Can, can Pronouns. Can I, can I give a can, for why I think would you that, shut up while I'm introducing you, or do I have to fucking drop you? Oh, sorry, I you're, just you're, said. Sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I, yeah, if you'd stop fucking talking, Pete, we'd get to there. So let's start over one more time. All right. Hi, we have Pete calling from Philadelphia. Pete's a theist. Pronouns are he, him, and he wants to discuss how atheism can reconcile itself with morality when morality is a religious concept. But reality is not exclusively a religious concept, is it, Pete? Reality, no. How about morality? Why would morality be a re an exclusively religious concept? Because the terms of morality, like moral wrong and stuff, have, have historically referred to a divine law or something produced by a god. It's always been created in a religious context. There's never been so, a non-religious morality until very, or attempts to do that until very recently. Okay, so when you say... Uh, you're, you're making an argument from tradition, which is a fallacy, and now you're saying there wasn't an atheist one until recently. So you're admitting that it's not a, a necessarily religious concept. It's just that traditionally, your understanding is that it's been tied to religion. But I asked whether or not it was necessarily tied to religion, and you've now admitted it wasn't, right? No, I, I said there's been attempts. Well, until recently, there's only been an attempt to do so, but atheists have to there, there's no, 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 sir. You don't get to change your language, and you definitely don't get to change it to something that stupidly doesn't fix it. Because whether or not there's an attempt to have a morality is morality. What you're saying is that there's a correct morality. You can't. You haven't demonstrated that. Well, I mean, I don't even mean correct. I just mean a coherent and cohesive idea of morality. I have a coherent and cohesive moral moral position that I've lectured on for decades now. It's entirely secular. It's not contingent on any god or anything else. And I, I could construct a cohesive. I, I could construct a cohesive and and coherent and morality that completely is the opposite of what Matt has, and I can make sure it's consistent. And like, if it, you go do some research into philosophy, moral philosophers, not religionists, and not based on religion, moral philosophers have been constructing moral philosophies since the the concept uh, rose to, to prominence. So what we're saying is, while religions tie themselves to morality, morality is not necessarily tied to religion. I, mean, I, I want to point out that within philosophy, there is writings by philosophers like Alistair McIntyre and After Virtue that demonstrate this very point, that secular morality is incoherent. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Pete. 
Did you just ignore everything we said in order to assert without evidence that secular morality is incoherent? Is there just one okay, secular but, but, morality? I, I'm still asking a question. Is there just one secular morality or are there many? That's the question. Is there one secular morality or many? There's different ideas uh, among secular. Is there one secular morality or many? Um, many, probably, you could say. Many. And they're many all incoherent? About what morality and they're is. all incoherent? Yes, except I would say where that error theory, where error theory proposes that morality. Is Did you realize how stupid it is for you to say yes, except where? When I said, are all of them incoherent? Claims that morality is false. Are all of them incoherent? No. I'm going to keep walking all over correct. you and embarrassing the shit out of you. And the less you actually answer the question you're asked, the worse it's going to be. Are all secular moralities incoherent? If if you mean are all secular moral theories incoherent, everyone is incoherent except moral error theory. Good, which the moral goodbye, theory you absolute example, train wreck of non-thought, you dishonest, if asserting, honest, Matt, lying. No, 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 you're done talking. I'm going to mute you, but I'm not going to hang up on you. I'm going to make you sit here and listen and tell you hang up because I was very careful. You asserted that there are philosophers who claim not have proved, but claim, you said proved, but uh, that, that secular moral philosophies are incoherent. But when I asked whether it's one secular moral philosophy that was incoherent or all of them, you said all of them are except for. So you don't understand the concept of all. You don't understand the concept of except. You don't understand that people can have moral thoughts that aren't necessarily founded in religion. I constructed an entire moral philosophy that I lectured on for years and demonstrated conclusively that it was superior to religious moralities that was based on three foundational premises and them working together as guidelines for that. You're not a moral philosopher. You, if you were, you wouldn't assert that moral, moral philosophy is necessarily tied to religion and then change your mind so that it's not necessarily tied to religion. You want to pretend that atheism can't reconcile itself with morality. But the truth is, atheism can't reconcile itself with what you believe is moral. But atheism doesn't have to because atheism has nothing to say about morality. Atheism is a position on whether or not there's a God and you are tying morality to a God, not me. I'm tying morality to what morality is tied to, the evaluation of the consequences of actions on us with respect to goals, with respect to what leads to a better society, with respect to what harms people, with respect to what unnecessarily harms people, with respect to bodily autonomy, individual sovereignty, with respect to freedom and liberties. Those are the foundations for a good morality. If I were to ask you, matter of fact, I will. I'm gonna give you one, one chance. Under your morality, Pete, is it immoral for one hu adult human man to be in love with another adult human man. I believe so, yes. Yeah, nobody gives a shit what you believe, you little bigot, you ignorant little bigot. You don't get to call in and lecture me on about whether or not my morality is, inco is coherent or incoherent while getting absolutely everything wrong and then being a homophobe. Bye. I really, I, I, I just, I wish, that they'd just be honest. Yeah. Um, towards the beginning, making absolute claims about, you know, love is necessary. Religious beliefs is a necessity component, necess necessary component for love. Therefore, morality is necessitated by religion. Or I'm sorry, the other way around. And we got him to back off on that a little bit. But at that point, it's like, when you can't make those type of concrete claims, now anything you built off of that, it's all thrown into question because we could have gone a, a few different ways. We could have gone into, okay, different types of moral systems, whether they create desired outcomes or not, what those goals are, what we want to build off of. We could have gone the, down the route of, okay, we have numerous examples of animals exhibiting a moral code in the way they behave, the way they cooperate, the way they can either behave or not behave and to promote their prosperity. Um, if are those animals religious if it is if it is a requirement to have religion or religious beliefs or ideas before you can have morality does that mean those animals have religious beliefs 
How do you even test that? It's like you're, these are all claims that we can't even establish. They're already highly sus, but you can't even establish or, or, or demonstrate these to be true. You can't examine every thought of everybody on the planet. You can't examine the thought of animals that we see exhibiting morality. It's, you're building on a very shoddy foundation, trying to build up to God is required for everything that we believe to be right or wrong. Um, yeah, it's just, it, you're not going to get very far with this because you need to have a firm foundation to build off of. And we've, we already knocked the legs out from under it early on with you getting to back down from these concrete claims. It's really strange too, because the caller was also advocating for an absolute moral truth that yeah. necessarily stems from religion. And then when asked about his take on same sex love, not sex, not marriage, just love. He didn't say, yes, that's immoral. He said, I believe it's immoral, which means he already fundamentally recognizes that he has beliefs about morality that aren't necessarily true or aren't demonstrably true. Yeah. It, it, this, this notion that, hey, um, I, I, think it's, I think it's immoral. Well, I don't. And that'd be cool. I mean, we, we, should, we can do something like that. Eric and I can put on our hats if we want to and be like, okay, Eric, I think this is moral and you think it's immoral. How do we resolve this? I'd love to have been able to do that with Pete. Yeah. How do how, it would have been, you think, you think gay love is or, or same sex love is immoral. And I think it's moral. How can we resolve this? Because you and I, Pete, we have to share space and what we do and how we act impacts the people around us. And if I'm willing to, uh, advocate for a place where people are free um, to not be, you know, uh, maligned or considered to be immoral for who they love, and you're not, we got to find a way to resolve that as long as we're sharing space. And if you want to claim, well, it's my God says it's absolutely immoral. Well, okay, I don't care what your God says. And if your God actually wants to say that, he can come talk to us. But when you want to pretend that the rest of us don't have a moral foundation while you're advocating for things uh, where you're opposed to love, not just, not just sex or marriage or what you're opposed to love, Pete, happy pride month. It would have been nice to ask Pete what the goals of his moral code or his moral system are, because we can, we can compare the goals of our moral systems. Goals are subjectively chosen. So his goals and our goals may differ. We have preferences, what we want to see in the world. Once we have those subjective goals chosen, now we can evaluate objectively how we reach them. So I would be interested to see what his goals of his moral system are. Did he choose them? Were they dictated to him by a God? What, like, we have to start there in order to start comparing these moral systems. And I can have a subjectively chosen goal, which, like, you know, Pete's, you know, uh, actually I think it was a previous caller, uh, not hurting children. Um, I can have that as a moral goal. I think in general, children should not be harmed. Um, so now that I've subjectively chosen that goal, I can now objectively evaluate actions that either get me closer to that goal or further away from that goal. Yep. I can be entirely consistent about this too. I can, I can, I can have a, a, a list of a hundred items long. I want this, I want that, I want this, I don't want that. And here's all the actions that I think are good or bad in relative to those. Um, I can have consistency throughout and I can have a, I could, I could potentially subjectively choose just about every moral goal that uh, a Christian or some other God could have. I could just choose that and then come up with evaluations for it. Yeah. I don't need a God to do that though. Like it's not required. But we also, and, and this is, this is where I wish Pete had just been more honest about, you know, oh, I got called out on that. Yes. Yes. Let me, let me work this way. And, but it's, we didn't even get to touch on the fact that there are many different religions with many different views on what is or isn't moral. And to say that, that morality is necessarily a religious concept means that this concept that we all care about is solely within the purview of religion. And basically what he, what he was almost certainly going to say is that uh, all secular moralities are incoherent except where they agree with this religious morality. But the thing is, once you start comparing religious moralities, the question becomes, how do we know which one of them is correct? If your morality is religious, that doesn't tell me whether or not it's likely to be correct because I'd have to know which religion is correct. 
you know, which one of you actually represents and reflects the mind of God? This is why he had to say that he believes that it's immoral. Uh, but if he's, and I guess we didn't find out whether or not he's an advocate for the Bible. I was, I was rolling the dice yeah. on, on the fact that he is. Let's, let's be I honest. Like, I felt like it was going that way. I think another interesting question too would have been, um, you know, we have competing religions, competing, competing religion, morality, or morality is based on religion. Are there any inconsistent moralities based on a religion you don't disagree with? If there are, yeah. now now religion is no longer an essential component for, you know, uh, or I'm sorry, take that back. Uh, now it is independent whether the morality started from religion or not to determine whether it was coherent because you can have it both ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, and it gets worse from there as well because once we start comparing dueling religions to try to find out what the truth is, there's not a God stepping up to say, yep, this is this is the right one here. Yeah. The same, it's a shame so, a holy book wasn't more clear about these things. It would have really helped out. You know, by the way, atheists can be religious. And one of the most popular uh, religious philosophies, or at least that the Supreme Court has labeled a religious philosophy, is secular humanism. I don't consider it to be religious in the same category, but they're all protected as uh, religions and, and religious thoughts. As a matter of fact, not having a religion is protected equal to having a religion or to any religion that you want to advocate for. And so I can be atheist and be religious and use my secular humanism as the foundation for my moral philosophy, in which case now it's tied to a religion, just not a Christian one. But even if you were to say, oh, well, it's, it's the Christian one that's correct, which version of Christianity and at what point in time because if you look at the history of all the various Christian denominations, there are many moral issues that they have disagreed on and that they have changed their mind about. There are, there are gay-friendly, rainbow-flag-smothered Christian churches. I think they don't have a biblical leg to stand on, but they're out there. Yeah, some of the greatest schisms in Christianity were over a moral issue. Should, should the common folk have a copy of the Bible and be able to read it? Yes or no? We've got another theist yeah. caller, but before we get to that, there's some atheists that have been on hold because uh, I already took them off. We've got from Maryland, uh, Pranzo Hiham, is it Etienne? Uh, hi, yeah. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. I just want to make sure you, I pronounce your name correctly. Okay, yeah. That's the right way, actually. I'm surprised you got it right. Awesome. I, I, I'm surprised I got it right, too, but I, I try. So how's, how's it going? What do you have for us today? Uh, hi, I'm doing well. Uh, this is just uh, my first time calling, so I'm mm -hmm. glad to be on here. Um, there's actually uh, something going on here in my home state of Maryland, um, actually in the same county where I went to school in Montgomery County. So um, there's basically this new curriculum that they're rolling out where they uh, teach LGBT affirming topics and uh, lately there's been a lot of backlash from uh, religious parents over here um, because they <clears throat> they decided to um, eliminate the opt-out uh, option so um, they're upset that their kids can't opt out of learning about LGBT affirming topics. So um, I just find this incredibly frustrating um, because it seems like we've just made so much progress on this issue. And I'm also surprised because uh, I figured my own county was uh, quite socially progressive. So I'm surprised this is all playing out this way. So I don't know. I just wanted to call in and see what your thoughts are about this kind of issue. Yeah, I don't know much about your county or your area. And um, I mean, I don't find the reaction particularly surprising, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know your area and, and maybe in your area, it should be uh, more surprising. Yeah. And I think certain areas, certain counties or uh, states are going even more regressive than that. Um, not to not to like say, well, you know, this is not a big issue. It's obviously a big issue, but there's some states that are going even as far as 
uh, removing books from libraries, curriculum that talks about the civil rights uh, days. And we're still in the civil rights days. We're still fighting that fight, but they're going back and removing books that are critical of certain policies the United States had or describe, you know, certain topics like uh, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and other, you know, uh, parts of our history, things that we could learn from. And they're trying to remove those from education. And yeah, it, this is something that's kind of going on across the board. We're kind of seeing this, you know, um, history revisionist type of regressive curriculum in certain areas because there are people who are trying to erase history and trying to make people not think about these things. Um, yeah, it's, it's deplorable and it's sickening. It's really sad because we need that information in order to grow and become a better as a, as a civilization, better as a nation. Um, yeah. Is there a, is there something you want to like specifically you want to drill into about it or is it just general? How do we feel about it? Um, yeah, I just wanted to know your thoughts about this kind of thing. I'm really hoping the school board here doesn't cave in and cave into their demands and whatnot. But oh, so this is like a fight in progress then. Like there are attempts being made to remove LGBTQ curriculum, affirming, you know, school yeah. rhetoric about it and get it out. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a fight in progress, uh, there's lots of political things you can do about it. You can letter write, you can campaign, raise awareness about it, get pressure, you know, from those who agree with you on those who don't agree with you. Uh, especially, you know, like a, in politics, write letters, get, get, get the word out there and, and do what you can. Yeah, uh, sounds like a good idea. Yeah. It's one thing it's... to remember though. Um, <sighs> parents are probably always going to win fights like this. Um, yeah, on, in the sense of parents who want to opt I want their kids to opt out of certain teachings that are taking place in school are almost always going to be able to do that unless there's a compelling state interest in having it as part of the curriculum. And when it comes to most LGBTQ topics, I would say that while I think there's a compelling interest to teach it, I don't know how easy it is to make that case. Um, and parent, you know, it's not, it's not, Parents can homeschool, they can private school, they can select these things. And so things that they, they oppose in public schools, um, if they could move to a private school or a homeschool and not have to include them, then they're probably going to be allowed to opt out always. And while it is it's sad that parents are doing that, or parents can do this, um, the one thing to remember is that the kids are still going to learn. They're going to learn from, hopefully, from their friends. It won't be as robust, just like you wouldn't want, you know, I wouldn't want a kid of mine learning, you know, sex ed stuff from the kid down the street, but they're going to just like I did. I, my parents had the sex discussion with me. It was absolutely not LGBTQ friendly at all. It was, you know, one man, one woman, no sex before marriage as ordained by God, blah, blah, blah. And then after that, it was all, you know, within the bounds of marriage, sex is freaking awesome, except they didn't say uh, freaking, but uh, the, the enthusiasm was there. And so while we would love to make sure that we are able to teach kids what they need to know for the world that they're going to have to deal with, and that world definitely includes people of different genders, of no gender, transgender, uh, people of, with different sexuality, all of those are facts of life that we should be as a society working to equip children to deal with in the modern world. Um, but parents are probably still going to always be able to opt out. Yeah. There's two, there's two things that I think really helps save us from this type of scenario where parents can pull their kids out of school, get them away from curriculum. They don't agree with, get them into a homeschool and then teach them, you know, good godly Bible-based curriculum from answers in Genesis or whatever institutions there are. Um, that's a hard thing to combat. Thankfully we have two things. One is colleges, university education can't be homeschooled. You, you have to go to a university or a college and that's where you're going to come into contact with reality and with, with better grounded, you know, teaching curriculum and, and, and discourse. And then the second thing, which I think is even greater is the internet. Um, I think with what we're seeing right now with the way, 
uh, books are being banned out of libraries, curriculum is being revised, history is being revised. I think I think the the the, the soil is fertile for new YouTube channels to pop in and monopolize on the here's what your school is not teaching you niche. They can talk about books that are banned, why they're banned, what they say. You can get people to just go to a YouTube channel, start some content, talk about something that's banned, controversial, get, you know, monopolize on the drama around it and talk about why it's so contentious. And here's what this book actually says. And you can, I imagine if a person or two did this, they can probably get a good following and it will help combat that in probably a very large way because the internet is very effective at disinformation, but also real information and getting it out there, getting people exposed to different ideas. And if you have a way of, of doing it in a way that's entertaining and appealing, you, you could get a lot of followers in doing that. Yeah, those are both really good points. I appreciate the call. Thanks so much, Etienne. Yeah. Etienne, uh, thanks, thanks so much, Matt and Eric. Appreciate good it. Talking. Have a happy Sunday and happy Pride Month. We got a Theus caller I want to get on to. Let me just remake some of the uh, announcements real quick. And that is you're watching the Sunday show right here on the line. And in addition to the Sunday show, there are many other shows on almost well, most of the other days of the week, anyway. Monday is uh, Skep Talk, and tomorrow's episode starts at 6 p.m. Central with Forrest Valkai and Seth Andrews. Um, every, if, if you don't know who those two are, what what's going on? Definitely show That's up a good on, combination on Monday of hosts. for that. Uh, Tuesday, Dying Out Loud, uh, hosted by Dave Warnock, um, my very good friend who is, in fact, Dying Out Loud. It's the reason for the name of the show and everything else. He has ALS and is living his life um, in a way where he talks about it, talks about the struggles that he has, talks about um, his philosophical views on things. We've had great discussions about how to figure out what matters in end-of-life situations and all sorts of stuff. He'll be joined by Shannon Q on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, and you guys can call in with your questions about ALS, about living with a terminal illness, about being someone who's living with someone uh, with terminal illness and things like that. On Wednesday, I do a show called The Hang Up, uh, which will also be at 6 p.m. Central, and it'll be myself and J. Mike this week. Uh, and then the Transatlantic Call-In Show uh, is happening tomorrow. Or sorry, wow, I thought it was Wednesday for a second. The Transatlantic Call-In Show is happening on Thursday with Arden Hart and Alexander at 2 p.m. Central. Uh, so yeah, 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Those are, those are the days and times for shows. We have uh, calling into us right now, th thankfully, uh, Jim in Colorado, pronouns are he, him. Jim's a Christian who has a question for us. So welcome, Jim. Yeah. You're on the Sunday show. Hey, well, thank you. Hi, Matt. How you doing? Right. Yeah, I was listening to you the other day and uh, last week, I guess. And don't let me put words in your mouth, but I think you said if uh, um, if God doesn't reveal himself to you, either he doesn't exist or he doesn't want you to believe. Is that is that about right? It's pretty close. Uh, I, I Basically, the, the thing is, when people ask what changed my mind, I say God knows and he hasn't done it which means either he doesn't mm -hmm. exist or he doesn't want me to know he exists. Either way, it's not my problem. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, my question is, is, could there be a good God who doesn't want you to believe at this point, let's say, or doesn't care much if you believe or not? Could be. Could be all kinds of, ki of gods. But, um, okay. for example, the biblical God couldn't exist under those scenarios because the Bible's very clear in a number of different verses um, about salvation being open for all or for God. Uh, in First Timothy 2, 4, it says uh, that God des desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, no, I think, uh, no, I believe he does. So if, yeah, if the biblical God... Though, that he contact you, correct? No, the condition is that I don't know what it would take to convince me that God is real, but... Okay. If the biblical God, for example, exists, I would say that God absolutely knows what it would take to convince me, and I he hasn't he done that. Yeah. Yeah, and right. he hasn't done that, which but means, and by the way, there's there's one extra word in there, which means either he doesn't exist or he doesn't want me to know he exists yet. That extra word means that maybe God's going to reveal himself to me much, much later. I don't know why, right. um, but I, I, can't, I can't disprove that. Well, you're not 
real you're not real uh you're not anxious to be serving him right you don't like him from what other well i said. i was you do realize that i was a fundamentalist believing christian who served him for more than 20 years and was going to be a minister right yeah yeah i've heard that yeah and um but if god wants me to believe does shouldn't matter what i want right well i mean he wants a relationship if you don't like him you don't how, how do you know people. that i i don't, don't know that want, if well you if, called if, him, if you god called if god names, wants a relation right? if there's a god wants a relationship with me then he's got to make some sort of step so that I know that there's somebody. It's like telling me there's a girl that goes to this other school and she wants a relationship right. with me, but you won't, won't introduce us. Well, you could in introduce yourself, right? I don't know who she is. See, I, see are, are you suggesting, are you suggesting oh, that I, I haven't tried? I spent years in serious prayer and study begging God yeah. to help me be the best representative for him that I could be. I already believed. It's not my fault that God was silent. And Jim, you can, you can call. Now, though, and, and you, Jim, well, you, you know, you've said he's, nar why, sorry, why, you said he's why, narcissistic yeah. and different things. Jim, so yes, Jim, it's hard to understand how many, how are you with Jim, him? Jim, how many times and how often should I be reaching out to God if he doesn't respond? I don't know. I mean, it's um, there's a lot of cases where people tried to find, you know, were reaching out to God and then gave up and then came back. So it's not so impossible. Jim, that, that doesn't mean Jim, they found God. I, and that doesn't Jim, answer my question, but go ahead, Eric. What this what this really boils down to, which I, I can I can safely describe myself as this, and I'm going to assume that Matt's the same way because I've heard him talk about this a lot. We're both what's called non-resistant non-believers. Okay, we we don't believe that God exists because we have insufficient evidence to justify that belief. It doesn't mean that we are rejecting evidence. It doesn't mean we are steering away from it or avoiding it or resisting. We're in a state okay. where if we are we are presented with proper evidence, we'll believe. Okay, the fact that both Matt and I are non-resistant non-believers and we don't believe means that either God doesn't care to reveal himself to us or he has not yet. So right. anyway, yes, either, either of those two options, the ball is in God's court. He has to make the first move. The same way with Matt's analogy about the girl that liked you at school. If she's looking at you from a distance and you don't even know she exists, it is up to her to make the first move. I can't make the first move on something I don't think exists. Yeah, and by the way, yeah. If if you're still advocating well, for the Christian, if you're still advocating for the biblical God, the biblical God says there's nothing I can do that I have to be one of the elect that God that faith in God is a gift through God's grace that God knows whose names in the Lamb's book of life and who doesn't. And the fact that there are there are names that are in there and that aren't and there are plenty of people in there who are Christians falsely proclaiming it means that what you the position you're in Jim is you have a a massive screw up in this list of, well, there's people who've come to God. No, there's people who've come to belief in God. There's been no demonstration ever in the history of the world that a God actually exists or that anybody truly has a relationship with God. It's something well, that happens that's with... That's not my experience. No, no, no. No, no, Jim, that's I'm a fact. Evidence. No, no, Jim. How do you know it's a fact? I, Jim. Jim, hang on. He could reveal himself Jim, to one person Jim, and the other Jim, seven million, Jim, million. Jim, are you going to listen to me? Because I'm going to give you the opportunity. Prove to me that any one person in the history of the universe actually has a has or had a relationship with the actual God. How do you prove that? I, I can only prove it to myself. No, no, and sir. No, sir. No, sir, you can't prove it well, to yourself. Well, I saw a visible manifestation, but we're getting way off the question I was trying well, to finish. I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I, do you, so here's the thing. You're claiming that somebody has had an actual relationship with the actual God, and yet you say you can't prove it to anybody but yourself. But that's what's called self-deception. You can't prove it even to yourself. Oh, you are convinced geez. you... You are convinced How of it. How would you know but, what I saw along with 30 other people? You don't Jim, know that. Jim, I didn't, did I say anything at all about what you saw? 
well, I'm saying that, that I have proof. You're saying no, sir, you don't. That's what proof. I'm trying. I'm trying to explain well, this to you, you Jim. There's never I, been any proof. I, yes, I can. And I have said it. And I'm asking for you, you to demonstrate. Um, Jim, can I finish my thought? Oh, well, I'd like to finish one, too. I, I, I will happily do ahead. that. I believe that you are convinced you saw something. You have no way of demonstrating that what you saw was from a god. Do you? Not to you, apparently. Then you don't have any way to demonstrate it. If you can't demonstrate right, okay. it to me, you can't demonstrate it. Right? right? But you said nobody's ever seen had. I said there's never been a demonstration of anyone having an actual relationship with an actual God. Well, you said there hasn't been a, any proof provided. So. That's what demonstration right. means in that context, Jim. I'm happy to let you finish okay. your thought right. now. Go ahead. Okay. So my thought is, if there, you could be the case that you don't want a relationship with God. I already you acknowledge that. called him names, called him narcissistic. I, I've called Another lots thing. of God's names. Well, I've called Darth Vader a monster. I don't give a shit about the Christian God. I don't care. There's thousands of gods. They all fucking suck. What's your point? You were talking about the Christian God. Yeah. And his nature. Yeah. So why would he want it, a relationship with you? I, I don't know. That's but it's, the, Bible says, the Bible says that he does, and you believe he does. And so I'm saying, if the Bible says he does, and you believe he does, then what I believe doesn't matter. God could, could God, Jim, reveal himself to me right now in front of everybody in a way that would convince me? Is that yeah, possible for God? What would be God? the point? What would be? No, the no, point? no, no, no. You don't get to respin this. You don't get to respin this. I no, asked I'm a not simple. Spinning it. I'm then, asking, yes, I'm you are. Why he you would are. Do that. You are respinning no, no, it, I'm not. Jim. Yes, you uh, are. Jim, stop he, fucking talking, could... or I will mute you. Well, go ahead. Jim. Think, you know, you still haven't let me finish my thought. Oh, you're way more fucking done than you think you are, Jim. I'm, I'm really getting tired with the dishonesty. I'm just asking questions here. Oh, Is it geez. possible? Is it possible? Oh, geez. Blasphemer. Yeah, really. Accuser. No. Fucking accuser. Is it possible for God <laughs> to reveal himself to me right now in a way that would convince me? Yeah, he could. Okay, that was the question. He doesn't have a reason to. That's my point. You don't know that, jackass. You you don't know why God doesn't do it, do you? Well, it's it's obviously you don't you don't want a relationship with him. You're so full so, of shit, Jim. I want to know the truth, and I've said it many times. And if there is a God, no, that God I, knows I that God. Shut up, Jim. You're fucking muted. If there is a God, that God knows that I'm a sincere, and He knows whether or not I would be interested in knowing the truth. You don't know shit, Jim. You don't know shit, but you want to assert that you know why God won't do it. I've already said from the beginning of this call that there could be a reason why God doesn't want to reveal himself to me now or ever. Yes, hang up, run away, you little coward. Run away. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ unless my name's fucking Jim, and I'm trying to make sure that I don't have to defend it. Coward. Pretending you know what's in my mind. I'm happy to know if a God exists. I want to know if a God exists. The truth is that when you admit that God could in fact reveal himself to me, you have to come up with an excuse for why he doesn't. You have to pretend to know the mind of God. Liar, hypocrite, blasphemer. You have to make shit up in order for it to make sense because you're sitting there, Jim, saying, hang on, why won't God reveal himself to people? Why won't God just show the world? Why won't God provide the evidence? After all, he, I think he made me see a vision along with 30 other people. I think he made me see a vision. Why won't he do that for other people? Well, maybe it's because they wouldn't believe. Maybe it's because they don't want to believe. You don't even know your Bible. Oh, you believe God wants me to know, but you think he's got a reason not to. You're the one that's confused, Jim. You're the one that's on contradictory footing. You called in to ask, is could God have a good reason? And I said yes right from the get-go.
well, I'm not sure whether or not you said good reason, and I'm not sure whether the reason's good. But what I said was the biblical God can't do that if you believe that the biblical God wants everyone to know. Because the truth is God could reveal himself to me whether I want a relationship with him or not, because then I would have to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God, and I don't want nothing to fucking do with him. That is absolutely a possibility. As a matter of fact, it's the most likely possibility because you believe in a God that advocates for slavery. You believe in a God that advocates for misogyny. You believe in a God that advocates for child abuse. You believe in a God that is a moral monster and is winning the, game, the world, the universe's longest game of hide and go seek. But you saw a vision. I can't disprove your vision, but you also can't demonstrate that your vision is in any way tied to God. It's just that you believe it is. And when you see someone like me, you have to pretend that you know my mind. You have to pretend that I'm somehow, oh, I wouldn't believe even if God showed up. No, I'd absolutely believe. The fact that I don't want a king doesn't mean that I can't be convinced there is a king. I didn't want Trump as president, but I absolutely, absolutely am convinced that Trump was president from 2016 to 2020. This is... I'm absolutely convinced. What yeah, I, whether or not this, I want a relationship or want a king, yeah, good. This is this is where Christians conflate knowledge of a being's existence and worship of that being. I can acknowledge yeah. that a God exists and not worship Him because of whatever reason. Those those two are separable. And it, the, the way the way the reason I was bringing up non resistant non belief earlier, Jim, um, was because if there is one non resistant non believer in the world, and that person goes to their death without believing in God. That means God either didn't want them to believe or didn't bother to reveal himself to that person before they died. That puts God in the position of allowing someone who could potentially be saved to endure death or punishment or whatever your flavor of Christianity teaches you to believe. It, it boils down to, I don't believe because of so God, something God didn't do. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. That person goes to their death, not believing because God didn't do something god dropped the ball same thing with you know if we uh, the the girl in the high school um example if she doesn't make a move and reveal her existence at the very bare minimum nothing can happen and it is not the fault of the person that she's trying to convince she exists or that what she wants to have a relationship with it is her fault if and yeah and 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 basically you're looking at two possibilities one is that you're you uh, to, to to address this, you're basically going okay. To reconcile this, I have to either say to myself, there isn't a single non-resistant non-believer in the world that goes to their death. Everyone must either have sufficient evidence and refuses to believe, therefore making them resistant non-believers, or my God dropped the ball. Another way out of that is to simply water down your God, revise your theology to make this compatible. But we're basically pointing out a contradiction in your position here. You, you define God the certain way, all loving, all knowing, wants to save as many as possible. But then we establish that there may be people that go to their grave. And I can confidently say that I'll probably be one of them. I could be wrong, but who knows? Non-resistant, non-believers will go to the grave not believing. That means God dropped the ball. And, and that's something that a lot of Christians can't deal with. So they start accusing others of lying about their non-resistant, non-belief. No, no, no. You're really a resistant non-believer or oh matt god really just doesn't like you he doesn't like your personality he doesn't like how mean you are to me things like that it's you're, you're starting to try to redefine what other people are thinking in order to compensate for this contradiction in your belief and it doesn't work that way yeah it's it's incredibly frustrating even after 20 years of doing this to keep to, to, to answer honestly hey is it possible god has a, uh, some reason for not revealing himself to you yes it's it's possible. It's possible there's a God and I don't know it. It's possible that there's a God um, who doesn't like me or doesn't want me to know or doesn't want me to know now. There are Christians, by the way, who email me uh, and have for years thinking that the reason that God doesn't reveal himself to me is that he wants me to convert after he comes down in his glory and raises up all the believers so that I can be here as someone who knows the gospel of Jesus Christ to continue to teach it in that tribulation post-tribulation time and all that um and i i have to laugh because if jesus came down right now and raptured every believing christian 
while I would absolutely believe that that God exists, that Jesus is God, anybody who thinks that I'm going to spend time preaching the glory and goodness of that God or the righteousness of that God from that point forward hasn't been paying attention because there's nothing glorious or good about that. The entire system is absolutely broken and immoral from the from the very beginnings of let's set up and whether you consider it metaphor or allegory however you want to look at it let's set up a, a world so that man's sinfulness or man's re, re, uh, disobedience um, without good reason and without an understanding of right and wrong brings sin and death into the world such that it becomes an inherited problem and that the best solution is for god to take human form by by impregnating uh, a young girl um, and then giving birth to a human version of him that's fully human and fully divine and part of the Trinity and was always around but still had a birthday and uh, then to have him preach for a while but also make a flog and run chase the money lenders out of the temple and tell his disciples to go steal a donkey which would be a violation and violate a bunch of other things until they put him to death so that he can have a bad weekend and serve as a blood sacrifice for humanity so god creates a loophole for the rules that he's responsible nothing about it makes sense nothing about it is moral it's not how any decent person would act if they were god you wouldn't threaten your kids with a torture chamber in the basement and if you did you're a moral monster yeah maybe my secular morality is incoherent but <laughs> at least threatening kids with being tortured in the basement forever yeah doling is, out doling out reward and punishment based on whether you made the first move on a human or not is immoral i mean you're you're arbitrarily just choosing who goes to heaven who goes to hell based on what you do and don't do as that god yeah i i appreciate the call jim I, i'm sorry that you had to run off um in the midst of that but don't pretend that you know what's in my mind when you don't even know what's in yours. You definitely don't know what's in my mind. And when you pretend to know what's in the mind of God, that's heresy. That's what Jesus was killed for, pretending to know what was in the mind of God to the extent that he, he was killed at all. I, you know, but, well, and here's, here's a question on that. So we've got Susan in Washington, pronouns of she, her, has a question for us. How you doing, Susan? Fine. So uh, you're question, on the Sunday show with Eric and Matt. Okay. My question is, if there was a Jesus and he was crucified, why would he have been placed in a stone tomb instead of thrown into the open pit with the rest of the car carcasses of the people who were crucified? How do you end up in a stone tomb? How do you know he ended up in a stone tomb? That's what the Bible says. Okay. Sure. And is there any, how does is there any I mean that's that's where the Bible placed him. He rolled no, the, but... the the stone door in front was rolled back, and that's how he got out of there. I, I did we didn't ask how he got out of there. You are saying that that um you're saying how did Jesus end up in a stone tomb if he's in an estate? Why didn't you just get thrown into the pit? What's the Bible say? Bible says that he was in a stone tomb. What, how does the Bible say he got there? Um, the details of that had to do with people taking him down. Um, his mother held him, and then I, I assume they placed him. They asked but I would to imagine. be able. They asked to be able to bury his body, and it was granted by the state. That's how he ended up in supposedly joseph of arimathea's tomb so it was a, a friend or relative's tomb no it has been a mirror joseph of arimathea oh, okay. wasn't necessarily a friend or a relative it just a follower with some money <laughs> okay okay did I, I don't actually read the Bible. I was raised Catholic, and Catholics don't read the Bible to speak of. But yeah. over time and hear, hearing people talk, um, I've learned an awful lot about it. So, well, 
it's pretty straightforward. It, it, there are things that the Bible doesn't really address, like what happened to Jesus between 13 and 30. Um, but yeah. th there are other things that it does address. So when somebody calls in and says, how did Jesus end up in a tomb? I'm like, just read the story. Um, Joseph Arimathea is the one who <laughs> assumed responsibility for the burial of Jesus' body after his crucifixion. Okay. The Bible describes sense. him as just a wealthy man who followed Jesus. Okay, so then it wasn't specifically about Christianity that he was crucified. No, I mean, crucifixion otherwise... was cru crucifixion was was a the, one a common or somewhat common version of capital punishment. He crucified along yeah. two other people who were thieves. They weren't they weren't just crucifying Christians, they were crucifying criminals. Yeah. If you take off the government enough, they're they're gonna kill you in that fashion back then. Well, he wasn't called a criminal, was he? Yes. Yeah. Treason. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I guess that's it. All right. Thanks, Susan. Okay. And thank you for the. Oh boy, it was so thank garbled you, that I heard, I heard the thank you as I was clicking the. the yeah, I heard the thank you too. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. At least I got. At least we heard the thank you. That's always good. Yeah. The empty tomb more, is always. Uh, go ahead. The empty tomb is a funny. Like the empty tomb is an interesting talking point around it because the Bible claims that you know, executed as a criminal. We know lots of criminals are just thrown in common graves, but except Jesus, he was so special, he got a tomb, and. Yeah. But only the Bible describes this. There's no contemporary corroboration that any record of a tomb being given to Jesus or even of his execution. And it's like, it, I don't know where Susan was trying to take it, um, but a lot of you know apologists try to prop this up as, look, Jesus' execution was special somehow because he had a tomb, even though there's no corroboration around it. It's just a, it's just a Bible tale. So, yeah, yeah, when people ask, you know, like, oh, how, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, explain the empty tomb. And I'm like, prove there was an empty tomb, first of yeah. all. But give, give, yeah. give me some proof that there's something to actually explain. But, uh, you know, I just verified Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned, of course, in the Synoptic Gospels. I don't think John mentions them at all, but I haven't looked. But Matthew describes him as a rich man. Uh, Mark describes him as a respected member of the council. And Luke adds, uh, and this is just from the Wikipedia article on Joseph Arimathea, because it's quickest, but Luke adds that he had not consented to their decision and action. Uh, oh, yes, John does mention him. Um, Joseph immediately purchased a linen shroud, proceeded to Golgotha, to take the body down from the cross. Yeah, so all four Gospels mention Joseph Arimathea, um, and he ended up in tomb, I guess, because, like, if I had to figure, if, if we're just to assume that the whole story is real, uh you know for the trial and crucifixion and and burial mm -hmm. um if i was running the state and i just killed a criminal because basically the jews asked me to uh because his his crimes were not as so much against the state as they were against judaism and so there's this politics make for strange bedfellows thing um i'd be happy to let them bury him that's one less person i gotta send my guys to the the guy's dead you do whatever you want with the body. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't need to, I washed my hands of it. I didn't want to crucify this guy in the first place. Of course you can take the body. Um, but yeah. All right. We have Ben in Alabama, an atheist, pronouns are he, him. And how you doing, Ben? Happy Sunday. You're on the Sunday show with Eric and Matt. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Um, so I, this question, um, a Christian asked it to me when I got into a debate with him, and I haven't been able to really resolve it in my own head. So um, I was telling him that – I told him that I don't believe beliefs are a choice. And um, I, I was talking to him about how skepticism is essentially withholding belief until there's sufficient, sufficient evidence. Well, he said that if you're withholding belief – isn't that a choice? And I'm wondering no. how, okay. Okay. So no. I guess what, it, uh, that's, yeah. that's a problem with the, that's a problem with the language where withholding seems to imply volition, but it's, okay. it's much in the same way that we would instruct a jury 
not to make up their mind or read any or make any decision until all the evidence is in. But the fact of the matter is, I am either convinced or I'm not. And I don't become convinced as a max as, as a matter of choice, as an act of volition. I become convinced when the weight of the evidence compels me to. And so when I say I'm withholding belief until it's warranted, all I'm really saying is I remain unconvinced. Okay. Yeah, that makes more it, sense. Um, maybe it was just the, uh, he was pretty like narcissistic and dishonest. So uh, he was like kind of slick with his words. So I guess that kind of goes back to what you were saying about a, a maybe a technicality on language, but um, we, we do that all the time with, with language, uh, you know, but, uh, and it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm a little more likely to back off now when people talk about belief as a choice. Um, I don't think that what you're convinced of is, is a matter of volition, but then they'll say, and, and this is what you'll get next when you, when, if you go back with this, what will happen next will be, okay. So you, you don't think it's a, an act of volition, but you're saying that you're a skeptic. Um, did you choose to be a skeptic? Yeah. Well, I would say, no, I'm not sure that I chose to be a skeptic. I'm not sure that I chose anything about what I'm convinced of. I became convinced that skepticism, which properly applies the burden of proof, is a wise way to go about determining whether or not we should believe things. And then they can be like, well, if you think it's wise, uh, how is that not an act of, uh, of volition for you to choose to be a skeptic? Well, to whatever extent I choose anything, and I'm not convinced that I really do, um, in the sense of I have will, but it, that doesn't mean it's will about doxastic things, about knowledge, information, uh, or what I'm convinced of. Um, I can't think of anything that I believe as a, I'm convinced that this is a true statement that was ever the result of just a choice. It's now what you can do is say, oh, I'm only going to listen to Fox News. That act of volition puts you in a position where the information that you are getting is of one type, could be all true, could be all false. It could be this weird mix that biases it. And because you've made that decision to just listen to Fox News, that informs your beliefs because of the information you get and the, because of the information you don't get. You can do the same thing with MSNBC or CNN or whatever else. I'm not just picking on Fox News, even though they deserve it. Sure. Um, for, for being liars and propagandists who admit that nobody should listen to their talking heads because they're just talking heads on a TV show and not a news organization. So Established the question then becomes, yeah, yeah, in court, in, in defense court. for multiple things. Uh, but in that case, then they could say, well, if you're choosing what information you, you're going to uh, evaluate, then there is a choice somewhere in the chain that ultimately leads to whatever your position is. And I could see where that, that could be viewed as somewhat reasonable. I made decisions about, well, I mean, I'm, that still may not be a choice. It may be entirely deterministic yeah. that, you know, somebody only listens to this. But when we talk about choice and decision, um, the further removed the choice is from the thing you're trying to point to, the less of a, of a, of a the weaker the connection is kind of like the butterfly flapping its wings that ultimately causes yep. a tornado. Um, yep. It's not that the butterfly chose to cause a tornado. It's now you can engage in self-deception. Um, and so I think that, but I'm not convinced how much of that's a choice either, because if ultimately you became yeah. convinced for bad reasons, that active self-deception was necessary to protect the truth then you still became convinced of this process of self-deception and not didn't just merely choose it. The notion that somebody just says, you know what, I'm going to actively work to deceive myself. I, I, I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. I don't, I, I'm not going to become convinced it's a good idea. I'm just going to actively work to deceive myself and believe things uh, for bad reasons. I, I, I can't prove that that doesn't happen. Right. Because just because I can't get into people's heads, but I, I don't, I, I see no good reason to think that it does and plenty of reasons to think that it doesn't. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, like I know that self-deception, deception all too well. I mean, I, I've coming up next month, I will have been out of Christianity for a year. So this kind of, this stuff is new to me. Um, 
but it's uh, certainly eased the cognitive dissonance. Um, I don't have to, I think the whole self deception thing is um, more, well, for me at least, it was more of just keeping the status quo. And I mean, I live in the Bible Belt from Alabama, so um, rocking the boat is not, uh, certainly not taken taken lightly. So um, it's, it's a tough thing because when you think about it, so I'm convinced that our beliefs inform our actions, not just in a simple sense, but that you always act, always, 100% of the time, you always act in accordance with your beliefs. The problem is yep. sometimes you have beliefs that while they may not be in conflict necessarily with each other directly, are in conflict with regard to an action. So for example, I'm diabetic. I would like to live a long time. I would like to be healthier. Those are things I, I actively believe, and I take some steps towards that. I also want to feel good and enjoy my life. Those two beliefs aren't always in conflict, but they are when there's ice cream in front of me. <laughs> if, there's, if there's ice cream in yeah. front of me, what tends to happen most often is that my belief that I would like to enjoy myself may in fact outweigh or, or, or take priority over my belief of wanting to live a long life. And we go into all kinds of self-deception about it. Like, oh, you know, one scoop of ice cream won't hurt. And it won't. That's yeah. true. It's not, and yeah. lactose is a, is a lower glycemic index than fructose and, and uh, glucose. And, and so, you know, it's better that I eat the ice cream than, oh, I don't know, a big chocolate bar. But I tend to get the ice cream yeah. that's got the chocolate bar in it. Uh, I think like, uh, ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey is one of my three favorite flavors, and that's just got big chunks of chocolate and banana ice cream with walnuts. And if you put that in front of me, there's no way I'm not going to eat at least a whole pint. It's I know it. And yeah. so at what point am I actively deceiving myself? At what point am I making a conscious decision to override one of my beliefs? I may not be. It just may be that we have this tiered system of facts and values and they can also be like morality situational and there's a situation under which i'm going to do something that actively harms me because it doesn't merely harm me because it actually does something that makes me feel good and benefit as well anyway enough about my uh stupid health sure. decisions but I ho hopefully that made a little a little bit more clear Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate the um, explanation. I've, uh, you, your uh, videos helped me a lot when I was leaving Christianity last summer. So um, keep on doing what you're doing. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Ben. Yep. All right. I, I have now turned chat into an ice cream discussion area. It's the human condition, according to ice cream, according to Matt. What's funny yeah. is, uh, and not to go on and on about my diet stuff, um, Arden. It was our wonderful producer today, Arden, who's down the hall, um, is is absolutely wonderful. And is probably over there nodding and, and somewhat giggling at knowing, yep, that's exactly what happens. And yet we both do it. But I like ice cream and she really doesn't care that much for ice cream. And so it makes it sometimes it makes it easier. Sometimes it makes it harder because there are desserts that are worse for me from I, than ice cream. And I'm likely to get those just so that we can both have something. Yeah at that at that point your your desire to 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 make her happy is out is outweighing the desire to live the maximally longest you know life or, or maximal your health yeah it's a trade oh and that's that it, straight up rationalization no, it no. is hey but you still you i'm not you, just you still believe for me yeah you still believe both are true though but you're, you're asking yourself at this point at this moment what do i value more and we do that all the time because we have lots of conflicting goals um, but at any given moment, maybe this goal is more important to me or this goal is more important to me. And that's how we make our decisions usually. Um, and yeah, I have no control over what I have no control over which goal at this moment is more important to me. You know, it's like, it's, I'm a doc yeah. sacks, like a volunteerist, you know, uh, I can't demonstrate that it's true, but that I, I adopt that because it's how I think my mind operates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, at any given moment tomorrow, I mean, today I could say, you know, like for instance, uh, uh, 
usually a couple days leading up to a show like this, I won't drink any alcohol because like the day after I drink alcohol, I get cloudy and it's hard for me to focus. So I'll like kind of go absent it for a while just so it clear up my mind and stuff like that. So I can be really sharp for stuff like this. But it could be like last night I had, I was at a friend's house for a bad movie night and they had alcohol there. And at that moment I was like, I want to be clear for tomorrow's show more than I want to, you know, have fun tonight with alcohol next week or the next time I'm doing a show, I could be faced with the same choice. And I could say at that point, you know, maybe tonight I'll drink. Why not? Because I'm going to value this more than the other one. And it's, I have no control over that. I have no idea what I'm going to be like a week from now or a week after that. And it's, 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 it's really just, you, you, you deal with it as it comes. It's, it, there's no planning behind it. There's nothing I can say, you know, I, I'm going to plan to believe this in the future. You just simply yeah. can't do that. Yeah. Not, not that it's anybody's business, but if you're willing to say, what was the bad movie? Oh, we watch Food Fight from, uh, it's an anime, it's a, it, oh my God. Food Fight is from 2011. There's quite the story behind it, but it has Charlie Sheen in it, um, Christopher Lloyd. It's, it's a CG animated movie about- Oh my God, is it the one with all the sexist hot dog jokes? Yeah, it's, it was bad. Okay. It was so yeah, bad. I've seen it. In fact, I'm sorry to the audience for even mentioning it. it <laughs> It definitely fits in the bad movie thing for a number of different reasons. Yeah, it was a terrible, terrible movie. I I like a lot of bad movies, but it's, I, I also like a lot of the the bad movies that are good because they're bad, not just like you know. Yeah, awful, but yeah, I wasn't in, I wasn't in control of the choice of the movie, but um, I'm a big I'm a big fan of Red Letter Media, which they do bad movies all the time. Um, I love watching their show, so uh, we kind of have our own little group that we we do that as well. But yeah. All right, we got a couple more callers to get to today. We got Sebastian in Louisiana, pronouns are he, him, uh, wants to ask us a question about the sort of arguments that theists rely on. Sebastian, you're on the Sunday show on the line. Hi, Matt. Hi, Eric. Um, uh, Hi. So really when I, I've been, uh, I guess I've been an atheist since I was 14 years old, you know, um, and a lot of the times that I've been listening to Christians and atheists responding to each other, um, a lot of buzzwords and stuff get thrown around, but rather, uh, one thing that I've noticed is that Christians tend to rely on grammatical and semantics arguments rather than addressing really the science and the understanding of what atheists, uh, rather or rather the explanations atheists and such put forth. Um, uh, like, for example, I think this is St. Anselm's um, ontological argument, um, where he says that you know, if you believe in the idea of God, therefore you you believe in God uh, because of that, and and and, and it, it doesn't really make sense. And I I wonder, are are Christians on the the same? Are they on the same page with atheist arguments, or or are we just kind of pa talking past each other most of the times that we debate? Well, first of all, that's not any variety of an ontological argument that I'm aware of, let alone St. Anselm's, but ontological arguments, ontology deals with the essence of what something is. And so St. Anselm's thing is essentially that, um, it, the greatest being that I can imagine, uh, must exist because it would be greater for that being to exist than to not exist. And so a being that exists, that is necessarily greater than one that doesn't exist. So, uh, if there is a greatest being, then it must necessarily exist. But th that's neither here nor there. Um, right. You can't answer this question because, first of all, not all atheists or all theists are arguing in the same way, um, even with each, with each other. Um, don't confuse. And, yeah, I'm, I'm going to let Eric jump in here in a second, but just don't confuse the types of arguments you hear from the average person in the street, either for or against theism or atheism, with what the best theologians are presenting um, and the, the responses and rebuttals to those by the best sort of counter-apologists. He, for example, one, one of my favorite debate opponents for a long time was Blake Junta. Blake All right. um, ha, had a strong commitment to logical arguments, understood validity and soundness, understood fallacies. And it's one of the reasons why his primary line of, I, this is me pretending 
that I understand Blake's motivation. Not, I'm not saying that I know this to be true about Blake. It's just an assessment. Blake's, I think this is one of the reasons that Blake relied so much on Bayesian arguments for the existence of God, because he knew and understood the power of Bayesian arguments in other realms. And like it or not, you can make a Bayesian argument for the existence of God and against the existence of God, because it all comes down to how you're assigning priors and what sort of things you include and, and don't include. And so I don't think you'd ever see the sort of kind of look at the trees, simple teleological style argument from him. I could be wrong, but you'll see the same thing reformulated, reformulated within Bayesian analysis because he's arguing for the probability of God, not the actuality of God. And my apologies, Blake, if I got all that wrong, if, if you ever see this, that, that wasn't the point. I just want to clarify that somebody calling in saying, I had a vision, or I don't understand why a, logical foul, an argu a logically fallacious or, and circular argument isn't logical. Um, that stuff doesn't happen quite as often, but I will add one little caveat here. Most of the atheists that I run with and most serious debaters and people who do this would probably put like William Lane Craig up near the top of the tier of Christian apologists and would probably put Ray Comfort when it comes to arguments pretty low. The right, truth yeah. is the, banana they, argument. the two of them present the exact same arguments. They just don't present them structured and formulated in the same way. Craig's arguments are no better. Ray's arguments are no worse. It is absolutely window dressing st style language and gravitas, I guess, um, that propels Craig uh, to a higher level. Right. Um, well, then I, I, I did. I have to ask this question. I mean, um, because it's been going on for so long. This, this these debates have been going on for God knows how long. <laughs> um, do you think we'll ever reach a certain point of common ground with with understanding each other's arguments, or do you think we'll just this ar these arguments will just go on forever, not really evolving to anything higher or um, or anything better for us to understand. I think as we continue to debate these things and throwing arguments back and forth, arguing over definitions and ideas, um, I think it's 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 just this it's this slow, long process crucible where we're filtering out the bad ideas and hopefully coming to a better understanding of what actually is. I think if it goes on long enough. I think we'll eventually probably come to some type of reconciliation about things. It might just you know, it, it it can go either direction, but I think if we keep on going the way we are, I I see Christian apologist arguments slowly being whittled down to nothings, really. Um, kind of going back to what you were saying initially, um, to come to that common ground, I think we need to have agreement on terminology. And one thing I come across quite a lot when I'm examining apologist material is how shifty terminology becomes. Um, almost like a sleight of hand occurs in many cases. Like, um, for instance, for example, I was reading an article countering street epistemology because street epistemology has to do with faith and confidence and knowledge. Um, and a common question that a street epistemologist will ask somebody who believes is, okay, uh, from zero to 100%, how confident are you? With zero being no confidence, all doubt, and 100% being all confidence, zero doubt. And this article that I was reading, this counter article, immediately went to, well, we don't want to, we, we want to say 100 because we want to appear like we have this, but let's redefine 100 as, as, as confident as you are that the chair you're sitting in will hold you. And that's not 100% confidence. But in this article, they're trying to establish that 100% confidence doesn't equal 100% confidence. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. It, I see a lot of that in, in Christian apologist uh, material. And I think at the beginning of any conversation, it's important to set definitions, set them in stone. If they want to 
change something or talk about something slightly different, you need to sign that word and treat it differently or you know, treat it as related, but it, it is something unique compared to whatever term is derived from. Um, by doing that, by, by lining up our terminology, I think we can come to better conversations around this, less contentious arguments or conversations around this because we aren't disagreeing about, you know, what, what's your definition of faith? What's your definition of confidence like that? Um, but I think as time goes on, as we continue to discuss these things, I think we are refining these ideas. We're hopefully coming closer to the truth. Um, I don't know if one day, I mean, you know, obviously at the core of the, of the issue, it's, I don't believe God exists. My interlocutor believes that God exists, a God exists. We're not going to come to full, you know, co uh, like alignment on it. We're going to probably still have that disagreement unless one person switches sides. But we're we're going to at least have better conversations as we go forward. But I don't think we'll ever come into like you know full and complete alignment on things. Right, and then um, the, the the these kinds of debates still go on in philosophy. I mean, as far as I know, that we still can't really agree on the or have it at least a, a good idea of what a God means, you know, because God differs a, across the world. Um, yep. But um, I just want to say thank you for kind of answering my questions um, and good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Sebastian. All right. All right. See you later. I think, um, I think religions, as we know them now, will vanish not like the organized religions that we know right now um they're not going to survive but we've already seen the sort of woo based um line of thinking seems to be the trend the more unfalsifiable you can make your uh religion the more difficult it becomes for anybody to show that it's false. If you yeah. have something that's unfalsifiable, you can't show that it's false. Yeah. Somehow, somehow set your propositions apart from being evaluated by the means we evaluate reality, set up special rules around the claim or, or, you know, un or just eliminate falsifiability. Uh, as you said, um, yeah, I find that to be patently dishonest when it comes to trying to establish something because they're basically saying, I propose this, I claim this, and oh, by the way, you can't prove me wrong because my idea lies outside of reality or my idea lies outside of, of uh, the processes we use to evaluate true and falsehoods. Um, yeah, it's at that point, you have to go down to the basics and start making people understand, hey, your, 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 your epistemology there, your process by which you're coming to your knowledge claims is flawed. And if you have a flawed epistemology, you're going to come to all kinds of bad ideas, bad claims, and it's going to affect you in other ways. Um, yeah, it's a struggle. It's been going on for centuries. It's going to go on probably for centuries more. All right. Final call for today, unless we get a theist. If we get a theist, um, which I think we've kind of closed uh, phone lines anyway. Uh, but if we get one, we'll always take it. But Luke in Washington, an atheist, pronouns are he, him, uh, has a question about arguing secular morality. So, and this one, uh, I, I might have a little bit of fun with, so prepare yourself, Luke. Welcome to the Sunday show on the line with Eric and Matt. Hi, uh, first I wanted to clarify something, uh, that this is by no means, uh, a troll. Um, I'm sincere when I ask this question, but, uh, has to do with, uh, my best friend and I recently deep converted from uh, Christianity and we were trying to come up with some sort of moral framework to uh, replace it with. Yep. And my friend was kind of playing devil's, uh, or devil's advocate. And when it came to uh, the topic of sexual morality, he, was, uh, he asked me if, uh, if there's nothing wrong with uh, two people having sexual relations as long as uh, they're not harming anybody, then how can we condemn zoophilia? And the best okay. argument I could come up with is that it violates my conscience. Oh, no, so, uh, that's what, not enough. Whether or not something violates your conscience is it's not going to violate a, you know, somebody with, I don't know, ver, some other mental aberration or something. It's really easy. Um, animals cannot, at, to, our, to our ability to detect, animals cannot give informed consent. They, informed consent is the cornerstone of at least my secular moral system. 
um, individual sovereignty and the ability to give consent um, is one of the best grounds for determining what to do when any two individuals' rights conflict. Uh, it's the same reason why sex with children is wrong, because they cannot give informed consent. They are not capable of understanding the concepts and giving the informed consent. And so that, that extends um, to non-human animals as well. I would say that's probably the strongest. Um, the other, the other thing though is, I and, and this is why I said I might have fun with this. Is you may be making a mistake. You you may not be. I agree with you. I'm a, I'm opposed to bestiality. Um, not so much zoophilia, but I don't think people can control what they're attracted to. It's about what you do and and the it's yep. the sort of uh, engaging in sex with animals. But let me ask you this: You're trying to construct a morality where you can show that X is wrong. How is that not the cart being put before the horse? How is it not the case that you're running around making a list of all the things you think are wrong and then saying, how do I show that they're wrong? What if you find out like once upon a time, like I, I used to think that two men having sex was immoral, but that's because I got my morality from fundamentalist takes on the Bible. And I could have given up Christianity and said, okay, now, and I did do this, by the way, I did it for the vast majority of moral things. I was like, if I thought murder was wrong because of the Ten Commandments, what's my reason now for saying murder is wrong? And I did this. I took stock of my life for all sorts of positions. And there are positions that I used to think were immoral that I would still intuitively kind of right now feel gross about. But I have to recognize that I don't necessarily have a moral uh, prohibition against them. Um, for me, like incest comes up on occasion. Um, I think it's problematic anytime there's uh, potential grooming involved that can override consent. Here we are back to consent. And so I agree with you uh, that I view zoophilia as immoral. My reason, primary reason, comes back to individual, individual autonomy and consent um, and that they can't give informed consent to it. But the cautionary thing I'd, I'd say is just be, if you, if you, if you try to find a reason why something's immoral and you fail, then the only reasonable position you can have is I, I don't have a justification for why this is immoral, but you can still do the, it's definitely not right for me. Like, no, I don't mean right into the moral sense. I mean, I don't want anything to do with this. Like I have no interest in there, there are scenarios where sibling attraction comes up where people like who were separated from birth, fall in love and get married. And then they find out that they were siblings. And then they have this horrible, you know, crisis of conscience of, you know, Oh my God, we met and fell in love and we didn't know that we we're actually, you know, siblings or half siblings or whatever. Um, I, I think that a lot of harm is done by implying that those people have done something immoral. Uh, no matter what, I, I think the reaction people have, uh, let me give it a different, a different example. When my former co-host, Don Baker, got married to his partner, I, prior to that, if I saw two men kissing, I would have kind of like a, you know, that sort of reaction. And I thought that, that was natural. I thought that there was something natural there. Oh, did I just get, get disconnected? Or... No, you're still you. good. Uh, uh, Eric, screen went dark, and I don't know why yet. Can you so hear me? We're good. All right. Yeah, we, we can hear you, Luke. I just wasn't sure if I got dropped okay. or if everybody did. Anyway, the short version is when, when they kissed and jumped the broom, I didn't feel that anymore. And that's what made me realize the strength of the naturalistic fallacy and how sometimes even the things we point to as natural aren't. So it may be that you, you're like, well, sex with animals is wrong because uh, the Bible said so, and I just still feel it's gross, but what's my secular justification for, for that? And I can't come up with anything other than my conscience. That would still be good enough for you to say that whether or not it, whether or not it is morally wrong, it's nothing I want to do or have an interest in. But I think the informed consent issue probably sells it for everybody or should. Right, cool. Well, thank you for that insight. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for calling in. If you got nothing else, oh, I guess not since he uh, hung up. Well, on that note, uh, we, we lost Eric. Um, 
somebody in chat said, why does Matt call Eric Luke? Did I call Eric Luke at any point? I don't recall. Yeah. Oh, I was talking to the caller. All right, maybe I got confused. Who knows? Anyway, welcome back, Eric. Uh, before yeah, I wrap great. everything up, please take a moment to tell everybody where else they can find you, because I know they've enjoyed sitting here listening to you for the last almost three hours uh, along with me. So where can they find you? What's going on? How you doing? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have a YouTube channel called Skeptics and Scoundrels. Uh, still a relatively new channel. Uh, I've been doing a lot more live content past couple months than pre-made content. But, um, yeah, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, I also have a Twitter that you can connect to me on. And, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Well, this has been the Sunday show here on the line. Be sure you turn in for Forrest Valkyrie and Seth Andrews tomorrow on Skept Talk at 6 p.m. Central. Also, Dave Warnock, Shanna Q, Dying Out Loud Tuesday at 6. And myself, I'll be back with J. Mike on Wednesday. Uh, at 6 p.m. for the hangup. Then the Transatlantic call show will be Arden Hart and Alexander at 2 p.m. on Thursday. Huge thank you to our moderators. I see Cookies and Arjun and Dylan and everybody else, and especially to Critical Cupcake, Cupcake for being our call screener today. Make sure we got some good theists, some, uh, well, wonderful theists that maybe were more contentious calls, but I, I loved it all. And I don't think anybody got banned today. Um, no, the one guy wow. got banned, right? Yeah, uh, the guy oh, the yeah, 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 I completely forgot about the transphobe at the beginning, but that's different. Um, that's just almost always going to happen. In any case, there's a lot going on in this world. And there's a lot to this world from a secular perspective. When people are out there, atheists like myself, free thinkers, secularists, and they're having to face questions like your morality is incoherent. How do you justify that? Um, God won't reveal himself to you because you're a reprobate. He's given you over to a reprobate mind or you don't want him or why would he want a relationship with you or pretending that they know your mind, pretending that they know God's mind. You have to call that stuff out. You don't necessarily have to do it the way I do it. You don't have to get riled up and be like, you coward, you jackass. You don't have to do any of that. Uh, I'm not, that's just who I am. <laughs> I do that in person or on the show and uh, most of the time I'm okay with it. Not always proud of it. There's not one way to do this, but it has to be done. Sitting back and letting the religious keep their privilege, keep their position in the world where they get to look down on you while having no better answer, and in many cases, worse answers about morality, about reality, that has to be challenged. If you're not in a position where you are able to do it, either because you're not the person who wants to be confrontational, or maybe your job could be put at risk, or maybe your family life could be put at risk, then you need to participate covertly with those of us who are in a position to do this. We greatly appreciate everybody's support. Uh, you can contribute via Super Chats and things like that. You can also uh, contribute via the Patreon down below. But mostly, while we are happy to have more money coming in because this is uh, a job that we do, we want you to spread the word to get people to call in, to get people to participate, to get people to defend why they think they should have the mountain of privilege that comes with merely professing a belief that they cannot justify. Because what it ends up doing is marginalizing everybody else and creating an absolutely inequitable system that we have to fight harder and harder against. Religious freedom has to include the freedom to not have a religion. And it can't, as a matter of course, be exist if the government of any nation is in any way favoring religiosity over irreligiosity or one religion over another. Church state separation is critical. Freedom and individual sovereignty is critical. Consent is the cornerstone. It's not just the consent of the governed to be governed. It is the consent of everyone to interact in ways with the people around them and religion sets aside that consent entirely almost all of them to a fault and to their detriment and while it may take ages for them to actually the religions to curl up and die i think that it's inevitable and then you're going to be dealing with fuzzy woo beliefs that it's really hard to it's like nailing jello to the wall but if you make the jello cold enough, it just might work. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye, folks.
Bye.